Well, back in 1972, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong. Welcome once again to Superhero Stuff You Should Know. Once you thought that we were done with the Schumacher films, we are back to talk about the Schumacher films again. This is Clooney, Bobblehead Ben, the man who knows too much <laughs> about Batman. And with me, as usual, is. Andrew Burt Ward Dick Bush. <laughs> <laughs> Goes so well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, that's so. like 45 year old Chris O'Donnell and 10 plus broad. It's just the jokes that keep on giving. Yes, yes. So, years ago, we did an episode on a draft of Batman and Robin that's online, and there were a few differences between that and the movie, but it wasn't really, it wasn't nearly as dramatic of a difference between that and the final film, and I just thought that was it. I would never have to read a draft about Batman and Robin again. (laughs) And lo and behold, this year, a fan of ours, Derek O, uh, sent along what's labeled as the first draft of Batman and Robin, by Akiva Goldsman, dated February 1996. So this is an exclusive for us. This is an earlier draft than the script that's online, or earlier than the script that we went over, and I thought it deserves its own episode to go into the differences here. So just to put it up front, a lot of people might be wondering, okay, well, how different is it? And I'll preface it with this. There are less corny jokes and one-liners in this one. Okay. There's better execution of certain aspects, while the movie also has better execution of other aspects. It, unfortunately, though, is definitely not a Schumacher cut Batman Forever situation. This is not a drastically deeper, darker movie. There's no great subplot that was cut out of it about Bruce's psyche that was eliminated. It's, it's very much the same movie from beginning to end. The, the toy commercial for kids to enjoy, uh, for them to <laughs> like. But you might be interested in certain things because there's certain aspects of it that definitely shocked me as I read it, including it has a darker ending than oh, the ending okay. in the movie. So okay, weird. Uh, we'll go into it. not not drastically darker. I don't don't think like suddenly everybody dies and Batman's alone again, like that type of thing. Oh hello, <laughs> <laughs> Pe- Peanut showed up for a moment. Peanut cameo, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it it is darker than what's in the movie. So let's get into it. Okay, so, uh, we do open with the same big suit up sequence. In general, it's the, it's the same general story as what's in the final film of Batman and Robin versus. Mr. Freeze, Poison Ivy, and Bane, along with the whole subplot of Alfred dying, uh, just with different execution every now and then. So in the movie, they all, you know, there's this badass shot of them as they come out of the Batcave, and Robin's like, I want a car. Chicks dig the car. Batman's like, this is why Superman works alone. Like, obviously, that that creates the tone of what we're going to see here. So right. that was not the original opening line. The original opening lines are much different. <laughs> they all step out from the suit up, and Batman says, "Did you finish your homework?" <laughs> so, That's the first line of the movie. <laughs> yes. Oh man. And Robin's like, "Boy, do you know how to ruin the moment?" So, as I said, this is definitely not a darker script version of it. Okay. There's a little less of some of the more <clears throat> notorious gags, but there's also like other alternative corny, like one-liners or dialogue in this. So, got to keep this in mind. Uh, so in the Batmobile, instead of talking to Commissioner Gordon about Mr. Freeze, Batman talks to Robin, telling him you'll only work backup and no reckless stunts. And Robin says, Robin is a sidekick, a junior partner, the name after the ampersand, literally, because it's in the title. Uh, so <laughs> The name after the ampersand. <laughs> Our marketing's all over God. I know. He says, I am Nightwing. Now, this is interesting. <laughs> okay. So, it was intended for this to be the debut of Chris O'Donnell as Nightwing. And O'Donnell even said there were plans for a spinoff with his version of the character in this, That's which is cool. Interesting. He's probably promised a lot. Yes, yes. It is cool, except for the fact that the movie is literally called Batman and Robin. So right. I'm like, it's kind of a... I get it, though. You can't call the movie Batman and Nightwing because you're just like, who the hell is Nightwing? As somebody No one's going to know. Yeah. But they were really trying to set it up, though, it looks like. It was. Yeah, they were. And what we have here are uh, images of a comparison between the Nightwing uh, in the New 52 versus Chris O'Donnell in 1997. Very much inspired, I would think, in the fact that they changed the Nightwing symbol to be red. I mean, Chris O'Donnell's Robin suit in this movie is very much a Nightwing outfit just with the addition of the cape. Right. So... Uh, but that's, I thought that was interesting. So throughout this, Dick insists on being called Nightwing, even though Batman keeps calling him Robin. Okay. 
So uh, we get to the museum to meet Mr. Freeze, and the script specifies something that is not in the concept art that we talked about last time. And last time we talked about how the concept art, there were the goggles on Mr. Freeze. Uh, that is not specified in the script. And this is also not in the final film, but it does specify Mr. Freeze, you're going to love this, he's wearing a fishbowl helmet. Oh, good. In the script. So uh, not only Not is over-designed this... to hell and back. <laughs> yeah, no. You know? Uh, he not only is specified to have this in the description, but it also plays a role in the plot, which is what I'm going to dive into a little later. So <laughs> he cracks we'll the fishbowl open at the end, like Bane's <laughs> Bane's uh, face piece in the Dark Knight Rises. That's actually pretty close. That's pretty okay. close to something that happens. So he throws uh, fish, uh, not fish, um, chicken soup <laughs> at him. <laughs> no, unfortunately, that's not in the. I can I can at least give that away. There's okay. no chicken soup moment in this, like in Heart of Ice, but still. Uh, this draft is a little similar to the Batman Forever one in the fact that we brought up how Two-Face's dialogue in Batman Forever's original scenes, he was originally a lot more verbose, a lot more melodramatic, a lot more monologue Here, Mr. Freeze's dialogue is actually like that. And storyboard artist Tim Burgard said, quote, all the dialogue was for Mr. Freeze. You could tell it was meant for somebody who would deliver it in a Shakespearean fashion. It was hysterical in my head. I was reading Freeze's dialogue as Schwarzenegger. So... Okay. Tim Burgard tells us to Hollywood Reporter, who speculates that maybe that's why there were rumors that Patrick Stewart was considered for the role of oh, Mr. Wow. Freeze, uh, which would have been a completely different movie. There are some moments in this, definitely, where I can picture Patrick Stewart as Mr. Freeze. And then there's other moments where I definitely can't picture Patrick Stewart unless he really <laughs> needed to pay off the mortgage uh, delivering it. I think so, he's been doing good since... <laughs> yeah, I think so. He did 85 or something, you know? <laughs> He's been all right. Yeah. Uh, Joel Schumacher himself denied that Patrick Stewart was ever in the running, saying, quote, it's a wonderful idea, but no one ever suggested him. I had met with Arnold several times because he was always interested in working together. I will say, though, that this is probably the draft that Tim Burgard read because Mr. Freeze has a lot more dialogue in this than in the movie. So there are two main differences between the Mr. Freeze in the script versus the Arnold version of the movie. One is that he speaks in a lot more Shakespearean way, and it's definitely inspired by Heart of Ice in terms of how he speaks okay. in certain parts. However, okay. there are still cold puns every now and then. But to be fair, there are cold puns in Heart of Ice, too. So yeah, uh, we got that. And the second That's one right. is there is even more stuff about how or even more demonstrations of love that Victor has for Nora in the script than in the movie. So okay. uh, a better interpretation, I think, than what we got. So I will actually have you read what happens in the opening where it's the same moment in the movie where he's taken over the museum, one of the guards pleads for mercy, and in the, in the basically, in the movie, Arnold's just like, mercy? And he just brings up that, you know, I, he's cold to the pleas of mercy. Uh, the original dialogue, however, is very much of a heart of ice. So I will have Andrew read that here right now. Okay. Imagine to never again feel the sun on your face, the stirring of a summer breeze, the warmth of a human touch. I'm afraid my condition has left me cold to your pleas of mercy. So yes, it still <laughs> ends in an ice pun, but you might <laughs> yeah. find that dialogue very familiar to Heart of Ice. Indeed, yeah, it's yeah. very similar, yeah. Yeah, to never again walk on a summer's day, like that type of stuff. So yeah. clearly Goldsman had like revisited that episode when he was writing this. Yeah. So uh, he still freezes the cop, and he nicknames the cop Copsicle after freezing him. <laughs> this is a moment where I'm just like, okay, maybe not Patrick Stewart for this part. <laughs> Foreshadowing um, Capsicle yes, in Marvel. Uh, and uh, Batman arrives, and there's no, you're not sending me to the cooler line in this. There's no hockey team from Hell line. There's no what killed the dinosaurs, the ice. Like, none of that dialogue is in the script. <laughs> so, <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. So that is not in there. At one point, Mr. Freeze does try to shoot Batman, but Batman ducks and Freeze ends up accidentally freezing one of his own henchmen. Uh, so that part's in here. But, yeah, there's definitely a lot more, like, long monologue type of stuff. And when Batman gets inside the rocket to try to chase after Freeze, Freeze brings up, he basically goes into every detail of how he's going to kill Batman in this monologue. Okay. So, here we go here. 
Can you feel it coming, Batman? The icy cold of space. To freeze to death. What blissful agony. At 10,000 feet, a small quiver. A tiny quake. The body resists at first. Before it knows defiance is futile. 20,000 feet. And the heavy hand of cold, like looming slumber, wraps you in a blanket, slowing your blood, chilling your lungs. And then, at 30,000 feet, what welcome relief, an end to rage and pain and cruel, cruel love, as your heart turns to ice and beats no more indeed that's a lot of lines but yeah <laughs> you can see how freeze. arnold was like i'm not saying that <laughs> that's my arnold impression <laughs> yeah you, you <laughs> i'm can not see saying that why why the storyboard artist was just like yeah it's kind of tough to picture schwarzenegger delivering a very shakespearean type of way that this is written and i'm just like <laughs> i get it what a world it would have been though if he if he did read these <laughs> and did like kind of good at it. Yeah. <laughs> Schwarzenegger elevates the movie. <laughs> wow. It'd be amazing. Yeah, it would have been incredible. So, yeah. Uh the rest of the sequence plays out pretty similar to the movie. Batman and Robin fail to work together and Mr. Freeze ends up getting away. And then we get to the origins of Poison Ivy and, and Bane. In the script, Jason Woodrew has a scene with Pamela Isley before she sneaks over and, and catches him creating Bane and auctioning him off to all the, you know, evil underworld people. So um, he kind of brings up, you sort of introduce him as somebody who is kind of almost trying to come on to Pamela. So she's obviously going to get her revenge later as Poison Ivy and killing him. Isn't that guy a floronic man from Swamp yeah. Thing? Yeah, yeah, right? Jason Woodrew, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what, a, what a deep cut. Well, it was really deep at the time. Uh, be yeah, less deep I mean, now. he did play a role in her origin in the comics too. So okay. I think they, I don't, I don't think they had in mind to just turn him into Floronic Man. I think they probably just picked a random comic, like, oh yeah, there's this guy, and let's just make him create Bane too while we're at it. And that was about it. <laughs> right? Um, Has Swamp Thing ever said, "You're a poser of the green" to her? <laughs> <laughs> to Poison Ivy? No, but he probably should. That's Let us what, know in the comments. That's what he should say, man. <laughs> <laughs> so he's introduced I'm actually a plant. You're <laughs> you're still a human. You're, you're a poser. That's true. That's true. <laughs> uh, so Dr. Jason Woodrow is introduced as taking Isley's research for his own projects, which, of course, are uh, Project Gilgamesh turning that one prisoner, Antonio Diego, into becoming Bane. So uh, all that stuff is still in there. She ends up sneaking in, finds out that he creates Bane. He discovers that she discovered it. And then once she reveals that she's going to try to rat him out, he tries to kill her with the chemicals. But, of course, he just ends up creating Poison Ivy. Okay. Moving further, we have an extended Batcave scene in which Alfred says that the lad, Robin, was a bit quicker to dry out than his Robin suit. And Dick is quick to correct Alfred that it's Nightwing. But, again, I'm just like, the movie's called Batman and Robin, kid. Come on. Yeah, they were trying to rush that. Yeah, so uh, arguably would have been a better title for the previous one, even though we went into like why Batman Forever was called Batman Forever. But uh, it's it is kind of weird if he's trying to spend the whole movie trying to be another name in here. Right. Uh, Bruce and Alfred talk about how Bruce is treating Dick, and Alfred brings up how uh, you know Alfred brings up how Bruce doesn't really trust anybody, and Bruce says that he trusts Alfred. And in the movie, Alfred just responds back, I shan't be here. I shan't be here forever. I and shan't be I here shan't. forever. Yes. Uh, in the script, though, it's a little different, where Alfred is a little less... Like, in the movie, he's just basically like, dude, I am dying. <laughs> but let me just try to not directly tell you I'm dying. Right. Uh, in the script, however, Bruce says he trusts Alfred, and then he walks off, and Alfred actually says that line under his breath to himself. So a very different okay. emotional beat. I thought that was notable. Uh, considering that those are kind of two different things. Whereas in the movie, it's almost like one of the clues that Bruce uses to figure out later on that Alfred is dying. Right. Uh, we then get a scene that's not in the movie of Alfred already passing along the schematics of the Batmobile and the Batsuit, schemat you know, all that type of stuff onto a disc, 
with him preparing to pass on the role of aiding Batman and Robin over to his brother. So, uh, moving further in the script, Mr. Freeze does not actually have his thugs try to sing Mr. (laughs) White Christmas uh, in this, (laughs) uh, nor are any uh, polar bear slippers identified. Sorry. Uh, oh he man! Did, yeah, he does walk around with his henchman Frosty, who's this guy here. He's Frosty. Walk- <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's walking through the headquarters, and they see the joy of the henchmen around them because they're playing table hockey uh, in their free time. And Mister Freeze brings them how much he can feel no pleasure like they can. And then after a beat, uh, he freezes his own men with the gun <laughs> and remarks, "Well, that was fun. Maybe there's hope for me yet." So he just killed his own men at that point. Well, he, he froze them, but. Uh, he tells Frosty to thaw them or replace them and says, quote, just go now or die <laughs> so that he can be with his Nora. Pretty okay. hardcore. Uh, there's no Vivica A. Fox character, a.k.a. Ms. B. Haven, as she's called in the movie. <laughs> but there is a character <laughs> named Snow Bunny who serves the same purpose of trying to come on to Mr. Freeze, who is immune to her charms because he only has his heart for one woman. Okay. Oh, which that's is, interesting. Yeah, which I always thought was a cool... No pun intended, but that was a good beat. <laughs> right, <laughs> Mr. right, right, now right. Uh, for Mr. Freeze. Like, for all... I, I know everybody shits on this movie, but in terms of the actual Mr. Freeze characterization, like, they kept the Nora aspect. They kept the disease. They kept the, the tragedy of his origin. They kept a lot of yeah. different aspects of it. Yeah, for sure. Um, like in the later draft, we do actually see Robin in the virtual reality simulator fighting Mr. Freeze, as Bruce uh, tells him to do in the final film. Uh he basically fights Freeze, and Bruce shows up as Batman, and Batman criticizes him, basically being like, you left your back wide open. And Robin's like, I knew you would be there. So, like, it's kind of like Batman's not used to working on a team, and Robin is basically reliant on the fact that Batman's always going to be there. So this creates an argument because of the fact that Batman himself is overprotective, given his own traumas of losing his family, which is still in this draft. You know, everybody... Again, a lot of people shit on this movie and stuff, but the main arc of Batman in this movie is the fact that he treats Robin this way because of the fact that he is traumatized by losing his family. He doesn't want to lose it again, and he has to confront that fear each time he goes out, and he confronts that fear again when Alfred is dying, and so he sort of has to find a way to overcome it. Does he overcome it pretty easily in this movie? Yes, but (laughs) let's not deny the fact that there is an arc here. Okay. Uh, now we get to the introduction of Barbara Wilson, a.k.a. Batgirl, and we get a major Batgirl thing that is not in the movie, but is in other drafts. Uh, in the movie, Batgirl is Barbara Wilson, who is Alfred's niece. Except in the original script, she is not Alfred's niece. Oh, she's yeah. his lover. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> she's the daughter of his lover. So, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> So, it is a woman he worked with in the theater in his acting days, which would have been the first time they mentioned Michael Goff's Alfred having a theater background. Tying into the whole acting aspect, because I know we talked about that in the Patreon, about Alfred stuff. So, that would have been cool. Alfred does... I'm wondering if this was why it was cut. Alfred brings up that the age difference was too extreme between him and her mother, which makes me wonder what the age difference was (laughs) or why they added that in. (laughs) (laughs) Trying to explain his age because he he could be her grandfather, not her father, yeah, though, right? They could have just fixed that with Great Uncle Alfred, I guess. Yeah, you know? right. Yeah, so yeah, there's something weird happening there. Yeah, uh, this scene is actually shot. They shot this scene. Uh, oh wow! In reality, we did not. I failed to cover it in the Batman deleted scenes ten dollar Patreon because I completely forgot about it. So we'll just we'll just react to that in the next ten dollar Patreon. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> On that. Wasn't really thinking about the Batman and Robin deleted scenes. Uh, oh, yeah. It also seems like Barbara is written to have a British accent based off okay. of how she talks. Oh, because she's related to Alfred. She's related to Alfred. She's going to school in England. Like, it actually makes a lot more sense than Alicia Silverstone being very right. Americanized in this. Right, right, right. I don't know how that would have come across in the cowl or if she pretends to put on a, you know, an American gritty accent as Batgirl but then has a British accent when she's... Right, Barbara. because yeah. it, it could help pinpoint, not not that we're kept by realism too much, but it could it could help pinpoint her a lot quicker. Well, yeah. I don't know. You know, it's it would be noticeable immediate, immediately, right? Yeah, yeah. Like what other British, you know, British immigrants are in Gotham? You know, that type of stuff. Yeah, so. it'd be definitely like a, a more um, 
uh, honed in or whatever a specific starting point. Yeah. But then again, this is Batman and Robin. This is the least. <laughs> this is the least realistic movie they've made about Batman. So exactly. Whatever. Uh, in the script, it said that par- Barbara's parents died in a car accident, which is actually similar to what happened in the comics. Barbara Gordon's parents. Uh, in the comics at one point were changed so that she was actually Jim Gordon's niece instead of his daughter. And then uh, because her parents died in a car accident, Jim decided to adopt her as his own daughter. I don't know why they did that. I think it's just a lot cleaner when she's just literally his daughter. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, call me old-fashioned. <laughs> but I just like it when she's Gordon's daughter. <laughs> I know, I know. You know? <sighs> oh, well. Uh, here's another really interesting thing that is exclusive to this draft of the script. So in the movie and in the script, Bruce deduces that Barbara goes to school at Oxbridge Academy based off, based off of the uniform. It's not, you don't have to be world's greatest detective to see that. But <laughs> <laughs> in the script, though, there's an indication from Alfred that Bruce went to that school and studied criminology there. So this is a cool backstory. It's okay. The Batman or the uh, the nineties Batman. Again, it's written at the at the time it's written as the sequel to this overall Bat series. This is before we got all obsessive about continuity and the multiverse and, and started splitting people up based off of whether it was a different actor playing the role. Like this is still supposed to be the same Batman as Michael Keaton when it was written. So right. uh it's kind of cool that so she is this already established her parents died, she has some connection to Alfred. And she went to the same school as Bruce did. You see what they're doing here. They're trying to basically hit you over the head that she's going to be Batgirl, even though that's clearly what anybody who has saw the trailers knows that that's going to happen anyway. But yeah, she had a poster yeah. and everything. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah. it, they weren't really hiding it, but yeah. all right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the script, we do get a scene of Poison Ivy and Bane arriving at the airport, killing a businessman and taking his limo and having Bane pose as a driver. You can... We only basically get this picture of it and it's spoken about by commissioner gordon that they did this but it actually was supposed to be shown in the script uh uh i don't remember bane in the script literally carrying the luggage while dressed in trench coat and a fedora on top of his mask like it is here but this was a shot for the movie this was, this was a shot from the movie this is official shows okay him. yeah yeah because gordon shows this photo to batman and robin being like poison ivy came in this way and, and all that so that's what it is, but it, we don't actually see them come off the plane and do this. In the script, it was, you know, Bane was, like, hidden in some sort of coffin, and then he breaks out of the coffin and beats the shit out of the, the people at airport security, and then she kisses the businessman, some businessman dude so that they can hijack his limo. For the aural out. listeners, it yes. looks like Bane and Poison Ivy are in Casablanca. <laughs> it is, <laughs> yes. Basically. <laughs> Here's looking at you, kid. Yeah, that's what that's what <laughs> when, when Bane can get out a word in this movie, <laughs> string a sentence together. He says that. <laughs> the, like, that's, his, that's his character arc. He's finally able to speak, and he talks like Humphrey Bogart. Yeah. <laughs> so here's looking at you, kid. <laughs> in this draft, uh, Alfred is still looking for his brother. However, in the movie and the comics, Alfred's brother is named Wilfred. In the in this draft, Akiva Goldsman gives the brother the name of Albert. <laughs> okay i'm sure I, I feel like gold was just like alfred albert sounds like they could be brother names but oh in my reality God. it's alfred and wilford anyway oh man all it's right great creativity on on everybody's part with these uh sibling names but anyway <laughs> people do that shit though man yeah like have, all, have all the same names for their all the start with the same letter and shit yeah i knew uh two dudes in college they were brothers one was named dash and one was named race <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Right. Well, it looks like the Pennyworth family was the same in that. Yeah, yeah. Uh in the next scene we actually see Mr. Freeze attempt to use a cure on his wife with a new formula he's created, but he is unable to be successful in doing that. And he says, No cure, my love, forgive me. So again, mm-hmm. more of Victor and Nora in here, which I thought you would appreciate. This would have only been aired like two or three years before this movie came out, right? Uh, Heart of Ice? Yeah. Because yeah. Heart of Ice, I think, is 92, 93 at the latest. Okay, well, and this was 97 or 8? This is 1997, yeah. So Heart of Ice. But they start Ice, writing it in probably 96 or so. 1996 is when this is, this is uh, dated, February uh, okay. of 1996. So, yeah, September 7th, 1992 is when Heart of Ice comes out. So we're okay, so we have four years. Yeah. Four years. It's enough time, but yeah, it just shows that Heart of Ice was just immediately uh, a big deal, you know? Yeah. 
I think uh, if you if they were to go even further from the Batman sixty six show, you would find that there is no his name's not even Doctor Victor Freeze. There's no Nora. There's none of that type of shit in there. Right. So uh, definitely, we're kind of lucky we got what we got in this, in terms of what they provided. Because they could have just is... easily been like, it's Arnold and he's freezing people with ice puns. That's all you get. Yeah, at least he had a little something, you know? I mean, yeah. would love to see Reeves handle this, but, uh, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> it could Obviously, it could have been a lot better, but it's it's yeah. fine, you know? Yeah. Uh, we then get the scene in the Gotham Observatory where Pamela Isley meets Bruce Wayne. Uh, now, here's something that's interesting. In the movie, Bruce has a feeling, say, Julie Madison, played by Elle McPherson, she is not in the scene. In fact, she's not even the whole script. The entire script, there is no Julie Madison. Ivy is already the female lead of this movie, but she's even more so the female lead of this movie in the original script. Uh, so Batman doesn't, for once, doesn't have any love interest at all in this entire okay. uh, thing. So that would have been interesting. So since Bruce isn't engaged in it, there's some very corny flirting going on between him and Pamela that's not in the movie because obviously his fiance is right there. So uh, <laughs> when Pamela introduces herself as Dr. Pamela Isley, Bruce says, oh, my mom always told me to marry a doctor, which makes a lot of sense. She did marry mm-hmm. Th- Dr. Thomas Wayne. Uh-huh. And Pamela Isley retorts that her mother told her to marry a millionaire. And uh, Bruce later reference- references the destruction of Jason Woodruff's lab and that, quote, all hands were lost. <laughs> and Pamela <laughs> puts her hands <laughs> on Bruce's <laughs> arms and rubs them and says, do these hands feel lost to you. <laughs> <laughs> Which I know definitely fits the corniness of this movie anyway. So, Oh man. Oh, yeah. Well. All right. Uh, we then get to the party where Batman tries to spring a trap for Mr. Freeze with the Wayne diamonds. And we get an additional little scene with them and commissioner Gordon, not in the other script, not in the final movie that I think fans will be very interested in. Commissioner Gordon brings up like, how did Bruce Wayne convince you and Robin to show up at this party? And Robin jokes that, well, Bruce Wayne has blackmailed him with Polaroids of Batman and Catwoman. <laughs> so we get a rare reference to Catwoman and Batman Returns in Batman and Robin. Okay. Um, Batman brings up that the real reason is, quote, every responsible citizen should come out for a good cause. A very <laughs> Adam West type of line. Right. Again, more evoking of Batman 66. And I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. But then... Gordon leaves and Batman turns to Robin and says, I hate talking like that, but I think he's come to expect it. <laughs> so I'm just like, okay, so you're kind of doing Batman 66, but also sort of shitting on Batman 66 at the same time. Yeah, right? Yeah. Just go ahead and just do full on Batman 66. I, mean, that's, 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 I say that's the, that's the reason why this is more maligned than Batman 66 is the fact that it's uh, it's not quite the same in terms, like there's a magic to Batman 66 and this one doesn't quite have it because it's like, yeah, there's some stuff for kids, but then you've also got some weird... <laughs> there's definitely a lot of innuendos with Poison Ivy for the adults. And, I don't know, it's just a lot of a lot of mix of other elements, too, that don't make it as clean or as fun as Batman. Yeah, just, just kind of, um, like we always say, have a take. And Yeah. I mean, he, it, was a, it was a take, but it was kind of... It was a cover of a take. It was kind of a cover band. Yeah. I mean... I don't know. That seems a bit too disparaging for Schumacher, but y- you know what I mean. Like, yeah, if, if I he get it. if he had more of his own vision, I think a big part of it too is that Clooney and O'Donnell are no West and Ward. You know, like Clooney, right? And this is saying something because Clooney is like one of the you know obviously one of the hottest leading men in the '90s and 2000s up until today and stuff, mm-hmm. and yet he does not match the same charisma as Adam West at all in this role. So yeah, I think that's part of it. Maybe there was the same Wall Street guy that <laughs> came down and like fucked up the movie or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. it's it, it's yeah. Go all the way sixty six, or uh, go back to Batman Forever or darker. Don't yeah. do something in the middle. You know. Yeah, like, this it's, is very much in the middle. Yeah, it's a little bit off that way. People, it's like uh, tonally confusing, I guess. Yeah, because now we kind of got an Adam West type Batman, but Chris O'Donnell is still like kind of in the same headspace as Batman Forever. Like I'm the rebellious, you know, annoying right, teenager. Right, right, right. In this one, I'm just like, well, Burt Ward was way more likable than that in the '60s. Show. <laughs> That's true. Burt Ward didn't have like a total. He was a kind of a goody goody, right? Basically, yeah. I mean, if anything, yeah. yeah, yeah. But they were trying to appeal to '90s extreme yeah, kids. I know. 
I know. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> so, uh, this is the party where Poison Ivy introduces herself, and you might remember when you and I were watching it. Just we don't know what the hell they were thinking because she shows up in this gorilla outfit and then strip teases with a gorilla outfit. Dude, we like, what, what is going on there, yeah. man? Yeah, that, that's just wild, dude. I think that's another Wall Street thing because when you look at this original script from Goldsman, she just shows up. Exactly okay. how she should have just showed up. She okay. shoves away one of the other girls who's supposed to be working there, and then she arrives with her green costume made of leaves and everything, um, as it's described. It's exactly what they should have done. But I guess someone decided they had a thing for gorillas, and Uma Thurman specifically <laughs> as a gorilla, and that's what made it in. So. You know what's like plants? Animals. <laughs> gorillas. They both yes. have living cells in them, so they're pretty much the same. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It'll be on theme with our plant girl. <laughs> plant woman. <laughs> so uh, she tosses dust over everyone. Yes, I know. Much to your chagrin. She does this, use it a lot. This is the first time, though. Yes, right? this is the first so time. So yeah, yeah. it's okay. It, up, and, yeah. up until the 60th time, <laughs> I think I'm okay. But I think she goes past that in she the movie. Bit, so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ivy also comments on Batman's costume in the script, saying, quote, the ears are a little short. And I'm not married to the rubber nipples, but definitely something to work with. Which she she mentions the rubber nipples in the script. She mentions the rubber nipples, rubber nipples in this script, which almost Man. almost sounds like Goldsman copy and pasted some internet fans' critique of the Batman Forever costume. Or something. There was almost no internet right at this time. It was yeah. at the beginning stages, maybe. Yeah. Because this was again what ninety six. Ninety seven. Dude, yeah. well, people weren't even. Yeah. Peop- that that was like right at the dawn of AOL, dude. Yeah. Yeah. In America, America Online. Mm-hmm. Oh man, yeah, that was everybody was pretty much getting online around ninety seven, ninety eight. Yeah, I think it's Goldman definitely heard some sort of criticism because that's what it sounds like. Mm-hmm. It sounds like somebody's critique of of the Schumacher costume in terms of like the uh, the rubber nipple rubber rubber nipples type of thing. So uh, that could be where it comes from. Uh, they the script also does not have the bat credit card. There's no bad oh, credit good. card in the script, so it was added later. Uh, People make fun seen. of that, but it's like, dude, out, out of they got guys like Batman and Robin on fucking ice skates. Like, yeah. it's you know, it's <laughs> it's just a silly movie, man. Yeah. <laughs> just, that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Like people, people really uh, take take uh, issue with uh, the bat credit card, but it's just kind of part of. It is really silly, mm-hmm. but it's it doesn't really stand out against everything else that's silly in the movie, you know? Exactly, yeah. It fits right in. Uh, we still get ice yeah. puns, though. Mr. Freeze still makes his entrance saying, all right, everyone, chill. So <laughs> that's still in there. Uh, we get some different dialogue between Freeze and Ivy when they meet for the first time. Freeze tries to guess her supervillain name, and the nicknames for her are Plant Girl, which I think is what you just called her, uh, mm-hmm. Vine Lady, Miss Moss, Garden Gal, and Poison Ivy calls him wow. Captain Cold, referencing the Flash villain. So, oh, nice. Yeah, that, that'd be good. Uh, in the movie, Ivy tries to use her love smoke on Freeze, but he's immune to her because of the condition that he has. You know, is it called yeah, Love blood. Smoke? I don't know what to call it. It's just a, it's basically okay. a pheromone type stuff. Pheromone dust, I guess. Uh, however... Love Potion like number that, ten and a half. Indeed, yes. I don't know. Uh, in this version, however, I told you it would come into the plot. Freeze is immune to the love dust because he's got the fishbowl helmet. So it doesn't reach anything. <laughs> he's got filters in, in terms of Why the air. Why would so she like, even think <laughs> it would get to him in the first place? <laughs> I guess I wasn't thinking, she says. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Pamela Isley, everybody. So, Did Bob Kane write this woman? <laughs> Is that what happened? Nope. No, ah, your brides ain't too died. smart, you know. <laughs> they so. might try something like that. <laughs> The fishbowl helmet pre- prevents her from using it on, which I do like, even though it does make her look more like an idiot. At least in the movie, it's it's more open, you know. So, I mean, <laughs> I, it just makes her seem dumb, you know. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> but yeah, the fishbowl helmet does play a role. So this is the first time it does play a role in the plot, and then it'll it'll play a second role in the plot later on. I was thinking so, if they did, if if Reeves does this fishbowl for the next one, which I think he should. Yeah, they might have to explain that it's super super glass or some yeah. sort of like ridiculously advanced glass. Yeah, Batman like punches it and just doesn't even make a dent. Yeah, nothing because it's if it's just regular glass or anywhere close to regular glass, it's gonna be um, 
Not that we want 100% realism again, even in yeah. Reeves's, but it's just a little bit, you know, mm-hmm. too, too, too weak sounding. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Freeze does try to freeze Batman and Robin, and Batman says, ice shields. So, yes, this is a form of the Bat Shield from the Batman 66. Nice. And you just put it in the back one. of his pocket. <laughs> yes. And it just goes away in the next cut. Yes. So the way that they do this is that in the script, Batman and Robin whip their capes in front of them, hit studs on their belts, and their capes turn into silver. And so the freezing beam reflects off of them and it says it forms a modernist glacier. So Wait, 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 wait. So they put the cape in front of them yeah, and then the cape activate them. something on their belt to change yeah. the cape itself. Yes, which is what Kilmer does in Batman Forever when he's caught in the fire. And so he just wraps the fire around himself and hits the hits the thing on the utility belt to make himself fireproof. So Oh, I forgot about that. I mean, I remember the fire shot, but I forgot that it, I like that. The the connection between the utility belt and, and the cape. Yeah. Uh it gives it more utility and shit like that. So yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's yeah, cool. Yeah, that's that's Schumacher's take on the bat shield in that. Uh that's as we good. talked about with the bachelors. Kil- well, it wasn't Kilmer, but the stuntman in the bat suit was actually thrown into the fire <laughs> with with that. It actually was fireproof. <laughs> That's right. So, but, but yeah, the, the bachelors told us yeah. Schumacher said to them, "I need Batman coming out of a fire. Give yeah. me that visual." Go did. back and listen to what they said. Um, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, Schumacher. He's a director. He just wanted that visual. Yeah, and they wrote it in. They gave it to him. Mm-hmm. Definitely, and it worked. A badass yeah. shot of Kilmer. It is great. I yeah. had it, had it, had kept it in mind. And forgive Peanut for meowing. I don't know. There's some door closed that he's meowing Peanut at has right now. Opinions about the bat shield here. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, I swear he's quiet all day <laughs> until I record. I know. <laughs> uh, so basically, we get the car chase where Batman's chasing after Mister Freeze and disables Robin's engine because he wants to protect him. Uh, like in the final film, Freeze freezes the Batmobile, but Batman leaps out of it and glides down and arrests Mr. Freeze. Uh, Freeze would have tried to wrap Ice Ice Baby while believing to kill Batman. <laughs> Something that was that old by this point, probably, because that was like 92 or 3 when Ice Ice Baby came out. Yeah, this is 1996. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Like but Ninja Turtles had already Stewart. done it. Ninja Turtles did this with the oh, second yeah, movie as well, you know, yeah. so... It just seems like an old guy writing it. Imagine if it's Patrick Stewart, though. (laughs) I mean, that would be incredible, yeah. Maybe that's why he wrote it. Yes, maybe. So, uh, basically, there's a gag then because he grabs Mr. Freeze, and Mr. Freeze's big tank drill drops down, and there's a gag where there's, like, down below, there's a guy trying, he's waiting for an empty parking space. Uh, So a car gets out of the parking space, he's about to go in, and then Mr. Freeze is car drops right into the empty parking space. The driver was like, that's my spot. So, obviously, more gags and comedy stuff. I said that there were less corny one-liners. I didn't say that was completely serious. So, yeah. uh, we have the standard scene of Dick, uh, I mean, the same scene from the movie in which Dick catches Barbara having stolen one of Bruce's motorcycles, and when he surprises her, she uses judo on him. However, this is where it's very apparent that it's written for a British actress, because her apology is, quote, my greatest of pardons. <laughs> because British people talk like that. <laughs> yes. I, don't, I don't think I've ever heard them say Yes, I know. A oh, British I person trust. say that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, that is not in the movie. <laughs> so uh, since Mr. Freeze is captured, he gets taken to Arkham Asylum. And we have one moment that's not in the movie. Again, more of Victor and Nora. Freeze is desperate to escape from Arkham Asylum. So he can get back to his wife. So he can go back to curing Nora. And the guards are characterized as being complete jerks who want to boss him around. And they say that, oh yeah, we'll find your wife and we'll use her to keep our beers cool. And you can forget about seeing her again. And that is what causes Freeze to fly off the handle and try to fight them. Okay. So it's motivated by his love for Nora. Which again, is something that I thought was... Um, is It's one of the strengths of the script, I think. It's, it's almost... I mean, it's kind of... It's a note that... Goldsman keeps playing over and over again, but it's one of the things that makes Mr. Freeze Mr. Freeze. As far that as is his thing, though. I mean, yeah, yeah that's that's fine, I yeah. think. I think so, too. So uh, then we get the scene of Ivy taking over the Turkish bath hideout and Bane beating up the Gollum gang members that are there. And then Bruce does have the same scene that he does in the movie where he hallucinates Poison Ivy during a date, but again, it's not with Julie Madison. It's with Model. 
is their character name. <laughs> so it's just <laughs> okay. a random woman. They hadn't they they didn't get to the casting point yet. Yeah, they didn't get well, they literally did cast the model for Julia. Oh Madison, yeah. They, they decided to actually make her a character as opposed to just random person for one scene. Right. So uh, we then get to the motorcycle race sequence that I think is probably our least favorite part of the movie, from what I remember us talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Barbara gets into a rivalry with this character named Spike, who I'll note is played by actor Nikki Cat. Nikki Cat then went on to be in The Dark Knight as the SWAT team guy in the in the front seat. He's riding shotgun during the car chase, giving all the commentary, being like, okay, that's not good, and all that type of stuff. So, yeah, he got to be uh, in both Batman. A rare thing to be in both Batman and Robin and The Dark Knight. Right, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So, uh, during the chase, Barbara loses Bruce's bike, and it gets destroyed, and then we just, in the movie, we just cut back to Wayne Manor. Uh, in the script, however, we get a little bit more. Barbara offers to use the winnings that she got in order to pay back, pay Bruce back for the bike that she stole. And uh, we have another scene of Dick. There's a little bit more of Dick and Barbara flirting throughout the script. So Dick gives Barbara a ride on the motorcycle. And there's a little bit more flirting where, like, Barbara, you know, she's holding on to him. And Dick's like, you have to hold me tighter and that type of stuff. Um, <clears throat> then Dick asks, like, who are you really? Are you Ms. Oxbridge in terms of her schooling or her <laughs> motorcycle name which is three jump <laughs> so three jump three jump is her motorcycle name <laughs> in the script okay yeah uh she says she doesn't know who she is and dick responds you'd be amazed at just how common that is around these parts so, <laughs> obviously more parallels okay here. uh and in the script barbara is the one who actually is the, who she's the one who figures out that alfred is dying and conveys that to dick who then conveys that to bruce so there is actually no scene of Bruce saying that he's figured out that Alfred is dying, as okay. it is in the movie. So just to recap, then, Barbara figures it out, tells Bruce and Dick, as opposed to the movie where Barbara just thinks Alfred is sick, but Batman's figured out that Alfred is dying. He's not just sick, but he's dying, as he says. Again, I prefer this in the movie. I prefer the movie. I think Clooney's Bruce is not given enough credit by anyone for his intelligence in general, because he's George Clooney Batman and everybody likes to shit on him, but I'd say what's fair is fair on this. I saw a, um, I did watch a recent video by key issues on like, they were going over like who could be, you know, who's the best live action Batman as a detective. And they brought up like Clooney's Bruce is an idiot because he didn't realize Alfred was dying until his deathbed. And I'm like, no, he did figure out that Alfred was dying before he was on the bat deathbed. He literally says in the movie quote, I can tell. So right. Again, I know it's not everyone's favorite Batman movie, but let's at least be accurate on this stuff. If it is your favorite Batman movie out of all of them, Let please <laughs> comment. <laughs> yes. I want to know because I like like Zach. His favorite is Batman Forever, uh, you know, and like there's a lot of Forever I fans like out there. Or eighty nine, I guess. But he talks about Forever a lot. He does, yeah. Um, so and I'm sure there's a lot of people where Batman Forever is their favorite mm-hmm. because it it just is. It is what it is, you know. People like some people like that kind of thing the most. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, if Batman and Robin is your favorite, I would love to hear. Yeah, that definitely. So, let us know in the comments. Yeah. Uh, if Batman and Robin's your favorite, you're probably definitely checking out this video because there's not a lot of there's not a lot of coverage like this on Batman and Robin out there. No, people want to forget it. it. <laughs> yeah, most of it's yeah. just people shooting on it. So. <laughs> <laughs> we try oh, to be man. a lot more sophisticated in, in superhero stuff, you should know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, back to Arkham. More of the Arkham guards being jerks to Mr. Freeze. I think it's just to make us not feel bad for them when Ivy kills them later. Okay. So yeah. one of the guards is just like, ah, I heard you were thirsty, and he throws water into the, the hypothermic field where Freeze is being kept cold. And so when he throws the water, it turns into snow and hits Freeze in the face. Okay. And then Freeze turns to the guard, and he simply says, your death will be slow. <laughs> okay. I like that beat. I think that's Yeah, cool. it'd be cool. Uh, <clears throat> other things is that, as previously noted in the Goldsmith script, the Joker's costume is said to be an Arkham Asylum, which would have raised a lot of questions at the time, I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but obviously that didn't happen. I'm curious if they were just like, yeah, let's not bother with it. We already have, you know, we can easily get the leftovers of the Two-Face and Riddler costumes from Batman Forever because we just made that. But, like, we'd have to go all the way back to, like, Pinewood in England to get the, the Joker costume for that. There's just no no reason to do that just for a simple Easter egg. I get it. Um, we then get another heart-to-heart scene between Bruce and Alfred. In the final film, you know, Bruce is talking to Alfred, and then Dick comes in being just like, Freeze has escaped. 
uh, they change around the timeline in this. In this draft, it's mentioned that Batman and Robin heard about the breakout earlier, but arrived too late. And now, you know, Bruce is already back from his visit to Arkham Asylum. So the timeline's a little different here. Um, something very, very interesting here, character-wise, is that Bruce, in this script, attempts to tell Alfred, after knowing that he's dying and, and knows that this is inevitable, he attempts to say, I love you to him. Oh. But it's, he just goes into tears and he can't. And Alfred simply, he can tell what Bruce is trying to say and all he says is, I know. And so do I, son. Mm. So do I. So that would have been a solid beat, though preferably with either Keaton or Kilmore, simply because of the fact that there's a, little, there's a lot more history between right. those actors and, and Goff, even just a previous film history in Kilmer's case with them and Goff. Cause it's just, if there's any flaw to the Alfred scenes between Clooney and Alfred, cause they're the best parts of the movie. Hands down. Yeah. Yeah. The main flaw definitely. is that it's Clooney. Like we haven't seen Clooney with this Alfred in any other iteration. So it's you just, just, I mean, yeah, I get it, but it's like just bond getting recast. I know. I know. You know, uh, but there's just something more, and I get it. It's, it's part of it. I'm not somebody who's just like, it must be in a different continuity because they changed the actor type of person. No, no this but, is the 90s, man. They weren't thinking yeah. like that. I know. <laughs> but I'm also like, there is something to be said, though, about that sort of visual continuity. Of it would have been better, scene. yeah. In yeah. an ideal world, it would be great, yeah. you know? Yeah. In an ideal world, Kilmer comes back for this one or something because I can't really see Keaton doing this version. But yeah. <laughs> Kilmer comes into this one and, and does that scene. So... Uh, I also think that it it speaks really solidly to the characterization of Batman in this movie is is how he's not able to say it due to his own uh, the walls that he's put up and stuff right that I think are very uh, apparent anyway even in the in the final film it's a, it's about the fact that he puts up those walls because he cares for Dick Grayson he doesn't want him to get hurt and he's afraid of losing his family and stuff and I, I think it's more apparent in the script than it is in the final film. And the fact that he can't say it out loud to Alfred is very reminiscent of kind of what we talked about with Pattinson in the Batman about like how much of his performance is on what he's not able to say, mm-hmm. you know, what he's not, he, he can't bring himself to say. And that's right. Stuff. So <clears throat> surprise, surprise everyone. There's depth to Batman and Robin, emotional depth to it, at least in the script. Yeah. So, <clears throat> uh, that's, that's what makes the Alfred scene so, so much more powerful than anything else really in this. If only the rest of it matched up to it, but oh well. Uh, there is a scene. Okay, so more stuff with Freeze and his wife. So uh, Freeze, in the movie, he mentions his wife for the first time, and Ivy gets jealous, being like, you never mentioned anything about a wife, and then they leave off to escape from Arkham. Uh, <laughs> in this version of the script, they have a similar exchange, but they're already out of Arkham. They're walking in a park, and when Ivy shows jealousy about Nora, Freeze grabs her by the neck, lifts her up, it smashes her against a tree for Whoa. bringing that up. And he says, without my wife, the world has no beauty. And that <laughs> okay. he will only repay Ivy once Nora is warm in his arms again. So I'm like, damn. All right. Mr. Freeze doesn't fuck around when it yeah. comes to his wife, which is very accurate, very true to the characterization. So uh, the characterizations in this movie are extremely goofy. But I would also argue that, like, Bane is, like, the main one who's more of a bastardization of the character. But, like, Mr. Freeze is still devoted to his wife. He might have yeah. ice buns, but he still has that, that tragic part of him. You know, Poison Ivy is still very much all about, like, the, the plants and plant life and all that type of stuff. Like, that's, it's cartoonish, but it's also cartoonish in the comics. You know? Batman is still, <laughs> Definitely. That is still very... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's a control freak about Robin and stuff, and that's... Feels very true, and Robin being, you know, brash and, you know, the quote unquote young daredevil, as he's called in the in the early comics, like that carries on in here too. Like it's, it's still very true to the cores of the characters, even if the execution is cheesy as hell. But yeah, you know, it would have been interesting made. to see if if they kind of really nailed the Adam West movie thing, and uh, like they just kept making these kind of movies, like in a different universe. You know, like what yeah. if what if Batman and Robin turned out to be if it was like ended up being one of the best ones, yeah, uh, we would have had like it would have taken a lot longer to get to darker Batman. I think, yeah, you know, the trajectory would have been a lot different. Yeah, like we probably would have gotten the Nolan stuff a lot more recently. Yeah, and and would they have 
Like, would they have needed Blade to save the comic book movie? Uh, you know what I mean? And yeah, then, and then X, the X Men. You know, mm-hmm. so yeah, it's interesting to think about. Yeah, for sure, definitely. Like, and recently too, like Bernard and every and and some other people think that the Batman's too dark, and they, uh, it's like there's some movement again to kind of go back to something less dark than what they're putting out. And it kind of reminds me of, you know, when they went from Batman Returns to Batman Forever. It's like people yeah. trying to push back against that tone. But what's in the back of my mind, I'm like, no, just just fucking stay true to what this is. Mm-hmm. You know, don't don't exactly. change it too much. Yeah. Stay true stay, to the director's vision. Stay, yeah, stay true to Reeves's vision for this and don't... Mm-hmm. Don't say it's too dark and change it because this is it's it's like we're it's like history repeating itself is what it feels like to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that. Uh, so while Freeze and Ivy are plotting, Batman and Robin do arrive at Freeze's lair to talk to the police about the escape. But here's a big difference in this draft: they do not end up finding Nora Freeze's uh, you know tank in here. Okay. So Ivy does. She sneaks in and then she pulls the plug on Nora Freeze because she's jealous. Uh, she kills her. So that's what's. Here's what's interesting in this. In the movie, right? She pulls the plug on Nora, then turns to Mr. Freeze and says, like, Batman killed your wife and stuff so that she can manipulate him. And then later on, Clooney's just like, well, Ivy tried to kill your wife, but I found her in time, and we could save her. And because of that, I know that I can help rehabilitate you so that you can become the type of man, basically back to being the man that she fell in love with. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's a lot more heroic. In this version of the script... Ivy actually kills Nora Freeze. Oh I shit! Said it would be slightly okay. darker. So, that's yeah, a that's big that's that's dark for sure. Yeah, I yeah. was thinking too. Like, it would be interesting if the first potion she tries on Freeze, it does, and he doesn't have the um, glass bubble or whatever. Mm, yeah. If he try, she tries it on him, and it doesn't work just because he's so in love. Yeah. Like true, true, true love, you know. Mm. So she's moved. She knows what she kind of sees what happens. She doesn't know about Nora yet. Yeah. But she kind of maybe she finds out this way, like, oh, you must truly be in love with somebody. Yeah, uh, that would have been know? a good beat. Yeah, yeah, that would have been, been good. Beat in, like Arkham or something, because that's like the first time that she meets him when he's not wearing the stuff. So yeah, she could yeah. Have easily done that. At no point does Goldsman actually have her attempt that again <laughs> after the after the fishbowl helmet thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After that. She's not that dumb. <laughs> yeah, uh, but which is probably why they rewrote it to be like, oh, it's just because it's his condition, so she can't like when it, she can't do it anyway, even if he didn't have the fishbowl helmet. Yeah, right, right, right. So, uh, so Ivy pulls the plug on Nora Freeze and Batman and Robin and go home. So there is actually no fight scene with Ivy and Bane at Freeze's hideout. That's going to the beats of that actually come up in a much later scene. So, okay. Uh, Freeze is hiding out in Ivy's lair and actually creates a makeshift Freeze gun since they weren't able to retrieve the original gun for him in this draft. I thought that was kind of cool. He's doing a Tony Stark, built this in a cave with a box of scraps type of thing mm. with the Freeze gun in Ivy's lair. So Ivy falsely reports that Batman killed Nora. In reality, it was her. In the movie, Arnold just turns around and yells, You lie! But... <laughs> Whoa! Like that guy did to Obama that time, or <laughs> yeah, some, somebody said that in Congress or something. You yeah. lie. <laughs> Clearly, he had just seen Batman and Robin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but in the script, Freeze is so pissed and thinks Ivy is lying that he lunges towards her. Bane tries to step in between them, and Freeze hurls Bane across the room. So okay, that's pretty fucking hardcore. And of that's, course, you know that's cool. Yeah, that is cool. That is the power of his love for Nora. I agree. How strong pretty- is Freeze with his suit? You know, <laughs> uh, it's supposed to give him. It enhances his strength. You know, like yeah. I think that's that is one of the lines in Heart of Ice, and I think it's also mentioned in Batman and Robin. So, if he's wearing the suit in this, then that would make sense, especially if it's Patrick Stewart. Uh, if it's oh, Arnold yeah. in the robe, though, I could see that happening too. Where he's just like he's already a built dude, and then you know because of his rage and stuff that like gave yeah. him adrenaline the rush to. To kick Bane's ass, because like in what in what stories do you usually see Freeze throw Bane across the room? You know, it's oh usually yeah, not for sure. That happens. That'd be cool. Yeah, that'd be yeah. kind of a cool scene. Yeah. So Ivy manipulates Freeze into her plan of genocide of Freeze freezing the world first 
And then I guess after it thaws, Ivy will create plants and they'll rebuild the world or something like that. That's not, <laughs> yeah. There's that no kind of way these two can fucking really get along. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. We at least know Ivy is, is manipulating Freeze uh, in this. Freeze yeah, basically yeah. just wants his wife back. But there yeah. is there is a great line from Freeze here as he decides if Nora is gone, what he's going to do. He says, no love, no compassion, all will turn to ice. <laughs> and that leads into an action sequence that is not in the final film, as well as the rest of the movie. And we're going to dive into that after the break. Explode When Defeated presents something really neat and full of meat. Those children aren't going to protect themselves in a brand new podcast series about everyone's favorite giant reptile. Godzilla? No, we already did that one. Rodan? No, nope, uh, we did that one too. Gorgo? Gamera. We're talking about Gamera. From turtles to medieval samurai golems on our new series, Demolition Die. Only on the HyperX Podcast Network. <laughs> Ellen, in 15 seconds, what is Nice Games Club? It's our game dev podcast. Steven, help! Game mechanics, accessibility, art and animation, level design, prototyping. Everything that goes into making video games. How's that, Mark? Nice. Listen to Nice Games Club wherever you get your podcasts or at nicegames.club. Lord have mercy, y'all. Do you like hounds? Do you enjoy pooches? Do you find yourself enjoying time spent with that of canines? Talking about dogs, y'all. As you might have heard, superhero stuff you should know has now teamed up with BarkBox. For every month, you get a box for your special canine. Pooches. Or hounds. That's right. One free extra month if you go to BarkBox.com slash Superhero Stuff Pod. Follow the link and you'll get a free extra month valued at $35 and valid for all multi-length plans. So get the BarkBox for your hound, for your pooch, for your canine. Your doggo will thank you. Support for Superhero Stuff You Should Know is brought to you by Manscaped, the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped's performance package is the ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Join over 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code Johnson's Ballsack. Yes, that's back for our longtime listeners. Johnson's Ballsack at manscaped.com. If my math is correct, you'll be serving 8 million balls. That's right. Now listen up, everyone. If you want the Bruce Wayne lifestyle, the billionaire playboy lifestyle, then you've got to shave. And we're not talking about your face. We're talking nose hair, armpit hair, pubic hair. When Bruce Wayne goes out with Silver St. Cloud, he doesn't have nose hair sticking out of his nostrils. When he's working out in the cave, he doesn't have armpit hair sticking out under his sleeves. And after he's gone down on Catwoman, because yes, that's canon, and she's going down on him, Bruce doesn't have a huge forest of pubic hair to get in her teeth. He manscapes. And if you want to be like Bruce Wayne, then get manscaped through us. I've personally been using Manscaped for years before they sent us these products for the podcast, and I know from experience that they're the ones I trust to reduce nicks and keep everything groomed down there. Now the Performance Package 4.0 by Manscaped has arrived, and oh man, is it a game changer. Inside this package, you'll find their Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, Weed Whacker ear and nose hair trimmer, Crop Preserver ball deodorant, Crop Reviver Toner, Performance Boxer Briefs, and a travel bag to hold your goodies. First off, the Lawn Mower 4.0. This trimmer is the future of grooming, and dare I say, the greatest ball trimmer ever. Their fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. Now, the Lawn Mower 4.0 is waterproof and also has a 400K LED spotlight if you need a more precise shave or if you're shaving in the darkest pits of the Batcave. Because this trimmer is waterproof, you can say goodbye to the mess on the bathroom floor. You thought that was good, but want to take your grooming game even further to the next level? The Performance Package 4.0 also includes the Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer. The Weed Whacker is also waterproof and provides proprietary skin-safe technology, which helps reduce nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate nose holes. 
Their Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and Crop Reviver Ball Toner will change the way you approach your hygiene routine. Trust me when I say, fellas, your balls will thank you. Manscaped even threw in two free gifts to their performance package 4.0, the Manscaped Boxers and the Shed Travel Bag. Bring your comfort and boxers to another level. It's time to take care of yourself, so go to manscaped.com. And get 20% off and free shipping with the code Johnson's Ball Sack. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use our code Johnson's Ball Sack. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. Now back to the show. And we are back to continue discussing the rest of the original Batman and Robin 1996 first draft. And one of the major points that's different between this and the final film is coming up right here. So we have a major action sequence, not in the movie. It's, nice. It's basically turned into the fight that's in Freeze's lair between Batman, Robin, and, and Ivy and Bane. But it's so much better, I think. So, okay. Uh, in the movie, Freeze just goes back to his lair to get diamonds to recharge his suit because he's at low power and stuff. And then Batman and Robin have that fight with Bane and Ivy. And then Batman fights Robin because Robin's under Ivy's spell. In the script, it's a lot different. So here we have an action sequence where Freeze does another heist because he has already determined that all will turn to ice. So he needs diamonds to power his suit, and he needs a giant diamond big enough to power his Freeze cannon to freeze all of Gotham. So he goes to the Gotham Diamond Mark, uh, Mart, and from above, Freeze goes inside, dropping down Tom Cruise and Mission Impossible style <laughs> with a cable, with Bane lowering him in from the roof. Uh, this would then, have been probably before the first Mission Impossible, too? Uh, actually. Actually, in terms of how it's written, because Mission Impossible 1 is 1996. Oh, so, well, uh, yeah. It would have been right around the same time that Goldsman is writing this. It's at least in the... Cause, okay, so... Mission Impossible 1 comes out in May 1996. This is drafted February 1996. However, let's not underestimate the power of trailers. At the time, right. And that was a big numbers. movie at the time. Yeah. I totally saw that in the, in the theater Same with my here. whole family. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. Maybe it's it, it doesn't literally say Mission Impossible style in that. That's just kind of the visual that I thought of when I was reading right. this. Uh, but <laughs> I can just picture Bane's the only one strong enough to be holding the rope <laughs> for Freeze. Oh, it's yeah. Yes. Especially if it's Arnold Freeze. In That's that. true. So, and that big uh, ass heavy ass suit. I know, right? So he's being loaded in by Bane, and Freeze uses mirrors to trick. There's this laser alarm system in here. So he uses mirrors to trick the system so he can reach the diamonds uh, and all that. And Batman and Robin arrive to stop them. But that's where Ivy comes into play. So she confronts Batman, and Robin decides to go off and defeat Bane. And he, he goes and tries to kick him, and he just bounces <laughs> off of Bane's body. So. <laughs> Whoop, 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 whoop. Yep. It's like so, a Looney Tunes kind of thing or something. Exactly, yeah. Uh, it probably would have been played off that way. Uh, so Ivy, just like in the movie, tries to seduce <laughs> Batman. <laughs> shot. <laughs> <laughs> this shot. Not a good shot, <laughs> This shot cracks me up, man. <laughs> this is funny, man. Yes. This is whenever she's um she's blown his shit in his face once again. Yes, exactly. Yeah. He's like, why are all the gorgeous ones? Homicidal maniacs. <laughs> Which, oh, you know, man. it's just, it sounds lame coming from Clooney, but you know Wes would have, could have pulled that line off. That's you know, true, yeah. Dozer verse type of thing. Yeah. Uh, so, Ivy tries to seduce Batman, and Batman says, Selena, chase. I'm going to make it a rule to avoid women on rooftops. So we have references to both Batman Returns, well, Michelle Pfeiffer, Selena Kyle, and a rare reference to Dr. Chase Meridian from Batman Returns, right. Nicole Kidman. So I thought that was really cool. This, this is this is an exclusive to this draft as well, uh, this line. So uh, this also sets up the line about why all the gorgeous ones have to be homicidal maniacs, which then makes me wonder what the hell happened with Dr. Chase Meridian <laughs> right? Uh, between forever and this one. Um, and yes, Ivy does throw the love dust in Batman's face again. And uh, Ivy tries to kiss Batman, but Batman's willpower is such that he averts his face. Uh, and there is an explanation for that later on. It's not just you know because he's fucking Batman. Still could breathe it in though, right? He breathes it in, but he's uh, yeah, he does breathe it in. He is basically breathing in the pheromones, 
but his willpower enables him to be able to turn away, and it is explained later on how he's able to do that. Uh, it was, was the cool. training in the Far East. <laughs> <laughs> it's the training at Oxbridge Academy. Okay, yeah. Called. Um, so Ivy responds, quote, my, aren't we a mother's dream? Uh, black eyeshadow notwithstanding. So <laughs> again, we're call- we not, we called out the rubber nipples earlier. Now we're calling out the black eyeshadow oh, for the first yeah. time. Cause that wasn't really something that was, um, really called out in universe ever. Oh uh, really. yeah, for sure. You know, it's just, he would don the, like, even if you look at Batman Returns, it was clearly treated as if, um, it was just part of the mask. Cause like they didn't have him still wear it when he took <laughs> it off. Like that. that's right, that's yeah. right. Yeah, uh, and then David Goyer did have a, supposed to be a comedic beat with it in Batman Begins, the original script for Batman Begins, where Bruce is about to go into the party after chain having changed from being Batman to being Bruce Wayne, and Alfred's like, "Sir," and he points to the mirror, and and Bruce sees the eye shadow and stuff that he's. Oh, that would have been good. I mean, it would have been funny, know. but yeah, uh, I do think it's it's something that. It fits this world, the okay. Schumacher world that they would be calling it out. You know, there's the same continuity where Nicole Kidman just basically gropes Kilmer, <laughs> Kilmer's rubber chest and says black rubber. You know, like it's mm-hmm. it's where it's called out. So Batman fights Ivy and does try to use the bat cuffs on her to arrest her. But then Bane arrives and there we got a Batman versus Bane fight. So Batman even fires a batarang at Bane and Bane catches it in midair and crushes it with one hand. Which I thought was pretty sweet. That's cool. Uh, that would been that would have been cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Does uh, he say down. the shadows betray you, <laughs> Mr. Wayne? Say shit in this <laughs> <laughs> he has no lines whatsoever. <laughs> uh, which is better than the movie because in the movie he's just like bomb. Yeah, so, bomb. Yeah, they treat him like the you know Frankenstein monster stereotype. So uh, down below, Freeze is barely running on energy. His skin is described as turning gray but he manages to steal the diamond and power up his suit. And then up above, uh, Batman uses a bat club, as it's described, to take down a water t- tower and has the whole water tower collapse right on top of Bane. A bat club. So this would have come from his utility belt? I guess so. I, like I, a I, telescopic... Brrrr, like a, a, a bat? <laughs> <laughs> and then he just knocks down the water water tower with one <laughs> swing. Yeah, I, I, he, I don't know. I, I think Colton <laughs> was just making shit up. He used some gadget type of thing in order to yeah. Out, never, ah, the prop like guys that. will figure this shit out. <laughs> uh, but yeah, those nerds. The water tower collapses on Bane, and Batman throws another batarang to enclose Bane in this, to this net. So, a water tower would probably kill an average person, but this is the Jeep sweats and Bane we're talking about. We we Jeep. talked about this before, though. Like it scripts. If you're if you didn't if you're not too well if you're listening to this podcast you probably are but let's yeah. say you're not like a lot of times scripts are kind of bare bones you know yeah it's it's not writing prose it's not a novel it's it's mm-hmm. you it's purposefully left open uh, to interpretation or to um, like for example the screenwriter usually won't write in a camera move because that's the DP's job that's the cameraman's job so yeah. shit like that. Anyway, yeah. continue, Ben. Even as I've brought up before, the Batman Forever original scripts just says, insert riddle here. Yeah. It's, <laughs> For the Riddler's riddles. Yeah, we'll figure it out later. You know, that yeah. That would have worked in the Batman. It's, the, it's pretty fucking bare bones because yeah. you're, you're imagining the movie. So, yeah. so And you're not trying to step on the, anybody's fucking exactly. toes. Yeah. You know, but if you're writing it and you know you're going to be the DP and the director, you I mean, of course, well, you can yeah. do whatever the fuck you want, but generally that's not the case. Yeah. Um, so Batman's about to cuff Bane when he sees Robin and Ivy and Ivy about to kiss Robin. <laughs> so this is hilarious. In the movie, Robin's about to kiss Ivy and Batman's like, stop. And that's what, that's what causes Robin to stop. In the script, however, Batman does not use his words. He's already pissed off as Robin as it is. He throws a bat ring that hits Robin in the face. What? <laughs> to prevent him from, from kissing poison Ivy. I'm Permanent like, facial you, scarring. Why didn't you use it on Ivy? <laughs> is what I said when I... When I read that part in the script, no, I was like, I was mad at the boy. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Clearly, you're you're mad at this. So, um, uh, let's see. <laughs> Batman and Robin do get into a fight. However, in the movie, right, it's over the railings, and there's, like, this vat below, and Robin just gets covered in pink goo and shit. Well, here at the rooftop. So, when Batman fights Robin over Ivy, Batman roundhouse kicks Chris O'Donnell off the side of the building. 
So <laughs> this, is like, a lot, this is a lot going on. <laughs> so, Dude, by I told the you. way, I haven't seen this movie since we watched it <laughs> like a, two years ago or so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But one thing that's coming up to me now that I'm seeing these visuals, yeah, this is like supposed to be one of the most colorful Batman movies. And you have like, this is a monochrome black bat suit. For a lot of this, it until is, he gets the dick sometimes piece. Sometimes it looks blue, but yeah, in in this type of shot, the way it looks is just not. It looks, it actually looks very cheap in comparison to what we've seen, like in terms of what we saw before that and what we see later. You know, it's kind of so, doesn't fit the rest of it. I think, but yeah, anyway, that's, that's what I mean in terms of the mismatch. You know, yeah, like, yeah. Imagine if they're just like, you know what, it's full on Batman sixty six. Put cloning in the blue and gray, not the the shitty blue and gray, the, the armor that he wears at the end, but like the the actual blue and gray from the comics yeah. and stuff. Yeah, like, yeah, that would have been cool. Don't try to make it like give any dark cinematography to it. Like just make it the literal like a modern sixty six remake, that type of stuff. Like the animated ones we got in like what twenty sixteen. Yeah, like go yeah. all the way with that type of remake. But instead, it's just it's just very much in between. We're just like we'll do some sixty six style stuff, but then we'll also. We got this whole other subplot of Alfred dying. You know, now that you mention it, that would have that would have totally set it off and a whole like it would have been the right choice for him to have the like a blue and gray suit. Yeah. Um, yeah would have make him more toyetic as well. Mm-hmm. Uh yeah, yeah, definitely. That would have been the move to make for sure. Yeah. Yeah, like it's you might as well. It's already fits this tone. It fits the colors of this world. Like you don't need to have them in in this type of black suit and that type of stuff. This is, still, this is basically leftovers from Batman Forever on this. I mean, even though, like, no yellow in the bat symbol on his chest, I find that odd for this take. For like, this they, take, they yeah. took even they took even that out? It's just odd. Yeah. It's weird. Like, I could see this maybe Sam's nipples for, like, Batman Unchained, you know, the darker sequel script. Yeah, that would have been... That, 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 that would have been better, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But for this one, I'm just like, yeah, they really could have done more with this. So. Clooney would have been a better fit for that kind of thing too, because Clooney's yeah. pretty funny off camera. Like if you look at him, uh, you know, he's doing like Popeye voices and shit and in interviews, and he's yeah. a real goofy guy. So yeah, if he that had kind the, of a goofier role, you know, would have yeah, been a better fit. The, the straight man in a lot of this, you know, when he's Adam West, he's still the straight man. That is true, I guess. Yeah, that's true, but. What if he got a little goofy whenever he got that shit blown in his face? <laughs> That's true. It would have fit true. then. I, th- I think Clooney just thought, I'm just going to play it like just generic superhero, that type of thing, and bobble my head through it. I, <laughs> I want to be a superhero, but I'm going <laughs> to still bobble my head, all right? Yeah, and, and again, it's just like he just does not have the charisma of Adam West. He just doesn't uh, in this, and this, that's what this version yeah, needed. Yeah, tough. I think the, the the thing is in this version is Batman, I think, is actually written, the characterization of Batman is written pretty well in this movie. Mm-hmm. It's just the performance of Clooney is just very flat when he's in the, especially when he's in the suit and stuff. Yeah. He doesn't really know how to play this version of it. So, again, it's partly, partially because of the, the whole mismatch that's going on here. Yeah. So, anyway... Where we left off is Batman kicks Chris O'Donnell off the side of the building, realizes what he's done, jumps off to rescue Robin. But Robin's already using his own line to save himself. They both land on the street, and Robin's like, I don't need you. And Batman says, Robin, wait. But Robin still corrects him, it's Nightwing, which at this point is probably super annoying. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, that would have, that, that, if this yeah. script would have made it, it they <laughs> definitely need to change that at least. That's yeah. that part of it. Yeah. So Batman goes back to the top, finds that the net that was holding Bane has been cut open, and all three of the villains have escaped, which prompts Gordon to be like, how did they get away? So, yeah, overall, I think uh, this would have been cool to see, as opposed to him dumping him into the pink goo, that type of stuff. Uh, We do have an additional scene at the Gotham Pier, where Freeze, Ivy, and Bane make their way to the observatory, where he's going to freeze all of Gotham, except uh, it's, it's phrased that they're on a gondola, with Bane as the gondolier. So <laughs> who made this Photoshop? Dan. Big thanks to Dan for providing okay. this image for us and photoshopping this. For the RO listener, we have Freeze and Ivy's faces on a couple, and the gondolier has the face of Bane from the movie. <laughs> Fuck 
fucking freezes faces. <laughs> and then Bane, yeah, Bane's a gondola. Honestly, dude, this would have been incredible, man. <laughs> if this was filmed. This is so silly. I think what I think what Dan provided for us here is funnier than what would have been in the movie. Right. And does Freeze like want to freeze the water that the fucking boat's on and then the boat fucking has an ice skate <laughs> under it and they just I it turns into a sled of sorts. Uh, unfortunately, that's not specified. Okay. I think I think it's they go and it's real. Wa- it's basically just regular water, and then when he starts freezing Gotham, then it turns into ice, which is why Batman needs the ice vehicles at the end. So has Freeze ever fought Aquaman? Uh, now I want to see him turning this fucking water into ice. Anyway, it's now my brain is thinking about all kinds of fucking combinations. That would be interesting. Or Jason because, Momoa's Aquaman versus Arnold's Mr. Freeze. You know, he's on a water bender, so but if he fought Mira, Mira versus Mr. Freeze, that'd be Ooh, interesting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you could do if it was ice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh man. Oh well. Anyway. Uh so on the gondola during this romantic this romantic boat ride. Yeah. Uh Freeze taunts Ivy that her little plan to quote seduce Rabies Man and Salmonella Boy failed. <laughs> That's just Adam West him. shit. <laughs> yeah. Dozier uh, shit. Freeze brings up that he will use the giant diamond he stole for his freezing engine using the Gotham Observatory telescope as his big freeze cannon, as he does okay. in the movie. Uh, later, Bruce and Dick find that Alfred has taken turn for the worse and has McGregor Syndrome Stage 1. Uh, this then leads into the scene between Bruce and Dick where they're arguing and how Bruce says he's going to go after Freeze and Ivy alone. And By the, the way, movie, McGregor's is a fake disease, right? It is a fake disease. It is named after Peter McGregor Scott, I believe, one of the producers. Oh, they had a disease named after him. All right. A fake disease named after him, yeah. Yeah, a, fa- so, a fake disease. I yeah. wonder, what do you think it's supposed to be? Is it like... I feel like it's probably some form of cancer. Okay, yeah. That's some what I was stage. thinking. Because they, they say that Alfred has like stage one, but Nora has like stage three. So like hers is a little too far advanced for Freeze's capabilities. You got but, it. Uh, Freeze is able to cure. He's basically able to cure stage one cancer in this okay. world, in this universe. So uh, in the movie, Bruce brings up how Poison Ivy is manipulating them and that they're perfect targets for Poison Ivy. This is interesting because in the movie, he's just like, we're perfect targets. He doesn't go into why they're perfect targets for Poison Ivy. In the script, though, he says we're perfect targets. We're both orphans, isolated, obsessed to the exclusion of life, love, and family. So that's a much deeper reason. Ivy is playing off on their need of for love and companionship because of the fact that they are orphans, because of the fact that they're isolated, because they, they have devoted their lives to crime and don't really have time for love and romance and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is, again, it's one of those instances where I'm like, there's a lot more depth to this than we give this movie credit for. Now, granted, this is in the earlier drafts. It's not in the final film. But it just goes the to most, show that there's some thought put into this. Most depth in the final version is whenever Alfred's talking about him fighting death. Yeah, exactly. Th- those lines are like deeper. That one section is kind of deeper than anything that made it to the final film of Batman Forever, probably, you know? It is, and it's one of the best lines to sum up Batman in terms of like, what is Batman but a way to master, you know? a way to basically fight death Mm -hmm. and that's that's where a lot of his control comes from that's where a lot of his insecurities about about robin being on his own come from in this movie and you know very few people really acknowledge the that aspect of this version of batman in batman and robin again i get it because Clooney's not the best batman uh at all in this but it's the way it's written i gotta give props to it i really like the way that batman is written in this movie in terms of this general characterization and what's being said about him. Maybe not the individual lines <laughs> of stuff, you know, that one part. scene is really great though. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. Any of the, any of the scenes, I'm sure there's fan edits out there that basically remove a lot of the puns and, and you know, it's probably like 30 minutes long really, but it's mainly just <laughs> the entire Alfred subplot and then him fighting freeze and then freeze giving him the cure for Alfred. Like that's, if you, if you just do that, there's probably like 20 to 30 minutes. Right, right, right. It's like right. a TV episode of a half hour, half hour episode. That'd be so, interesting, actually. Yeah, if you, if anybody out there has done that type of thing, we'd be interested to see that. So let yeah. us know. Let us know. Uh, so that those are the reasons in the script why uh, they're perfect targets. Hello. 
Uh, <laughs> my cat Visit from his cat. cat. Yes. Alfie. Yes. Alfie has made it. Yes. Buy the whisker box, everybody. Buy the whisker box. <laughs> say, the, say buy the whisker box. <laughs> okay, fine. All right. He won't say anything. Um, <laughs> next is a scene where Ivy tries to blatantly seduce Freeze. Uh, Alfie well, is going to be on Cameo where he'll wish you a happy birthday. <laughs> 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 He'll make more money than this podcast. <laughs> yeah. It's seventy five dollars a pop, so <laughs> Yes. Um so Ivy tries to seduce Mr. Freeze again. I don't know why this is, she says that she sees him as like a god in the movie and stuff, but I don't know she, I don't know necessarily why she's interested in sex with Freeze, probably because she knows that her kiss can kill anybody, so here's a guy who she can't kill, but anyway. She knows uh, he's jacked under the suit. That's, that's why. Her, no, yeah. I don't know. Also makes it a little weird when it's Patrick Stewart as opposed to Arnold. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't. <laughs> she fucking, I don't know. She just, it's he's older different men. from her. Yeah, yeah, that's who I guess. I don't know. She likes uh, bald guys. <laughs> so Opposites attract. That's probably what it was. That was maybe. what the writer's thinking. Like, yeah. oh, they're like opposites. So they'll to- the, clearly Ivy digs them and stuff. Plants can't reasons. grow in the cold, but their love will. <laughs> So Freeze brings up that only his wife can thaw his heart. And Ivy says, quote, right temperature, wrong organ, implying that she's not interested in his heart. Just his anyway. pee-pee. Yes, exactly. His, his penis, pee-pee. everyone. <laughs> That's what that was for. <laughs> so, <laughs> for those that say the B in subtle. <laughs> <laughs> Freeze comes up with the idea to divide and conquer and take on Batman and Robin individually. And he comes up with the idea of the Robin signal. And in a move similar to what Danny DeVito's Penguin does in Batman Returns, he moves his hand in front of a light to form a bird silhouette in front of the light. So I thought that was an interesting callback to Batman Returns. So Ivy says that she's hungry for poultry. (laughs) And then we go to the next scene. Does that mean she wants to get with 45-year-old Chris O'Donnell? (laughs) Yes, exactly. Uh, So we then go to the gala where Ivy disguises herself as Pamela Isley, seduces Commissioner Gordon with that love dust, into giving her the keys to the GCPD rooftop so they can steal the bat signal and turn it into a Robin signal and seduce Robin. So this is all in the movie. Bruce, however, spots her there, and he feels the same temptation of falling in love with Dr. Pamela Isley. So he, like, grabs her by the hand. He's like, I'm in love with you and stuff. And since Pamela Isley is not interested in Bruce Wayne, he does not suit her agenda at all, she rejects him in front of everyone and also threatens to sue him for sexual harassment. This scene would not have aged well. Uh, so yeah. This gives Bruce, however, uh, this is supposed to give Bruce the clue that Dr. Isley is actually Poison Ivy, but in the script, he he needs a few more scenes to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. This is, this is one another aspect that I'm like, eh, the movie did this better, where like in the movie, Clooney's at the gala, he feels the same pheromones things, he sees Dr. Isley there, and he also sees uh, Commissioner Gordon's there, and then later on, the bat signal's stolen. And then he, as a detective, he just puts it all together, being like, Dr. Isley is poison ivy. She used that thing on Commissioner Gordon to steal the bat signal and turn it into a Robin signal. And I'm just like, again, nobody gives Clooney enough credit in the final film, at least. In the script, he's kind of a dummy. So, uh, <laughs> a new he's scene. kind of a dummy. <laughs> yeah. In a new scene, uh, Barbara talks to Dick. She overheard the conversation between Bruce and Dick and knows that there's a woman in between them. She doesn't know, obviously, the details. She doesn't know that they're Batman or Robin or who Ivy is. But she wants to talk to Dick about repairing his friendship with Bruce, saying, quote, after my parents died, I had trouble being close. I pushed people away, maybe so they couldn't leave me first. Maybe Bruce has to learn it's all right to trust again. Maybe he's not the only one. And she moves in. It seems like she's about to kiss him, actually. Again, this this romance between Robin and Batgirl is only, like, very, very loosely implied in the final film. But it's more blatant in the script. Um so she, it says that she moves a stray hair from his face. I don't know how when his hair is short. <laughs> but she moves a stray hair in his face, presumably. She I guess. just moves next to that fucking buzz cut. <laughs> she just puts her hand on it. Where it uh, would be. <laughs> yeah. And she sees that Dick has an obsessive sketchbook of Ivy. He's been drawing Uma Thurman's face, I guess, in this version of the script. And uh, Then Barbara she fucking paces herself outside of the room. As quick as possible. Well, no, but not before she says, but you're too busy thinking with your pen. Obviously another euphemism for something oh else. Oh, my God. Again, yes. penis. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Bruce goes to the back computer, trying to figure out why was I so into Dr. Isley at the party? And he says out loud, I wish I could use you, Alfred. And Alfred says, you called, sir? As he shows if up If I could AI only form. stop thinking with my pen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was a good segue, should, Barbara. We should... were talking about somebody thinking of his pen, then we cut to Bruce thinking of his pen. <laughs> we, they should have just kept going with the pen thing. Like throughout the... <laughs> <laughs> That would have been amazing, actually. That's true. Oh, man. Here we it's are really with... Adults. Here we are with them using a Mac. You know, you can tell because the goddamn shit's on the right side. These icons <laughs> yeah. on the desktop. If it was Windows, it'd be on the left. And fucking nobody at this time except for people in the fucking movie industry and art industry fucking had a Mac, really. Like, I, I like, grew up with one. <laughs> you did? I did, yes. Windows. Okay, you'll. Anyway, fucking. We're an exception. I think. Though. Yeah, like 99, 95% of, of America probably was like Windows at this time. Like, mm-hmm. Windows ruled the 90s, man. In this continuity, Batman is Steve Jobs. He's got the black turtleneck. That's right. You see, there you go. No, yeah, I just remember, just when I see this, it just reminds me like, oh, yeah, there was a time where you only saw Mac, at least for me, you only saw Macintosh in movies. Yeah. I don't think I even saw it in fucking stores most of the time, man. That shit wasn't at Home Depot. To me, it's weird that he. I mean, shows Office up Depot. Des- <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'm like, why did he? Office Depot. It's weird. Alfred shows up on the desktop. You think he'd be like? Why did they even put the icons on the desktop? That's on? his fucking bat OS, man. <laughs> it's based on Unix, which is also what led to fucking goddamn the Mac. There you go. Very fine. Yeah. Or the new Mac, whatever. The, I don't know what the old Mac was. So, in yeah, I think he gets Alfred, AI Alfred gets a better introduction here. Max Headroom than, Alfred. Yeah, Max Headroom Alfred, because in the movie, he just arrives and Barbara shows up and just like, really? Like, were you that prepared that Barbara was just going to hack her way in? But uh, in the <laughs> script, Alfred brings up... He's more he prepared than Bruce in this, dude. <laughs> That's true, yeah. <laughs> Alfred brings up, he anticipated the day where he would be indisposed and, and Bruce would still need him. So Bruce has Max Headroom Alfred bring up Isley's background. Bruce finds out she worked in pheromones. And then Bruce is like, wait a minute, and has the back computer use, you know, the facial recognition thing to compare Pamela Isley's face with Poison Ivy's face and puts it together and sees that they're the same person. Again, Clooney in the movie is smarter because he doesn't even need to use the back computer for this. Okay. Um, and so he sees that Pamela Isley has been Poison Ivy the whole time, and he says, quote, amazing what a good wig and contact lenses can do. And I thought Clark Kent got away with murder just wearing those glasses. <laughs> so... Another Superman reference. We got a Superman. We got, you know, the first Superman references in a Batman thing in the Schumacher movies with the whole, you know, the circus is halfway to Metropolis and Batman forever. And this is why Superman works alone and Batman and Robin. And we would have gotten an even more blatant one here with the whole Clark Kent thing. So Superman uh, works more alone than fucking Batman does, I think. That's what I think is interesting. Everybody's you know, like, right? Batman's the loner. I'm just like, is he? Yeah, is you he think really he is, but he has a whole team of children. He hasn't been a loner since 1939. Yeah. <laughs> Superman kind of is on his own most of the time, unless he's in a Justice League comic. Yeah. And then, like, yeah, he's got, like, there's Superboy and there's Supergirl and, you know, they've got the Super Pets. But they're not as, like, I feel like they're not as integral to, like, the main Superman stories. No. The major Superman stories in no. comparison to, like, Batman's got, like, Nightfall was very much involving the Bat family. No Man's Land very much involving the Bat family. Uh, all these different ones. You know, Dark... You know, people sign up. Year One, Long Halloween, Dark Victory. Those are the three you need to read. Like, like Dark Victory has the origin of Robin. Superboy and Supergirl and all of them, they kind of... They're there, but they kind of just get their own runs. They're not like... Yeah. Well, I mean, they do team up from time do, to time, just, but it's do, less integral. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, basically... Bruce asks if there's a cure for the pheromones he's been poisoned with. And Alfred says, contamination passes after a couple days. So Bruce says, I don't have a couple days. So he's still contaminated with the pheromones that Ivy gave him. And Alfred says, quote, sometimes the only way to resist unbridled passion is to find something you care about more. Which starts Mm. to explain how Batman was able to resist the pheromones. So uh, that gives Bruce a clue. Uh, He then finds out that the bat signal has been stolen. And we later get another freeze in Ivy scene. With Ivy, it's a slithering into a black version of her costume, which we did not get to see. Whoa. Yeah. Black plants? I don't know why. Those don't exist. (laughs) Actually, they probably do. They thought that through. I don't think they thought that that through. They're just like, yeah, it would be cool if she was in black, as opposed to this. Like, yeah, just keep the colors. Chlorophyll? More like borophyll. (laughs) 
Free says, she quotes you fucking uh, Happy Gilmore. I mean, uh, Billy Madison. <laughs> He says, once you capture the bird, you will unmask him. Then I will know who Batman is. So, okay. We've now randomly started a new subplot where Freeze and Ivy want to know the identities of Batman and Robin. I don't know why we've added this this way into the movie. Can't be starting subplots this fucking late in the movie. <laughs> it's just fucking, it's not going to work. <laughs> this is Akiva Goldsmith wrote, wrote this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to put, if you want it, you got to put it fucking in the first act. This yeah, is. I know, I know, I know. It should have yeah. been earlier where Freeze is just like, but I, if only I knew, you know, if only I knew who Batman or Robin were, that type of stuff. That would have fit in. But here it's just like, he has no other indication that he wants to know all. Oh, there, there's Peanut. I got Mr. Loud Boy here, Peanut. Oh, we're going to have another and visitor. The gent. Yes. <laughs> the gent. The gent, yes. Here we yes. are. Somebody yes, screenshot it. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> okay. That's our, that's our cat break. <laughs> Now, back to your scheduled programming. Yeah. So, yeah, th- this would have just been better if they had previous lines. Of just like, if only we knew who Batman and Robin were, or want to unmask him, that type of stuff. Uh, but it seems a little late in the game. Also, Freeze reveals that he has recruited his henchmen back from the, you know, for the big finale. Because there's kind of a gap here in the movie where okay. you know, he gets captured, comes out of Arkham, is working with Ivy and Bane, and then he now has the henchmen at the end of the movie. Uh, Bruce and Robin have their scene in the cave. This is the infamous, she wants to kill you, dick, scene. <laughs> My friend said he was a little bit older than us. He's like three years older than me, <laughs> so probably six years older than you. Yeah. Uh, he said he just laughed his ass off in the theater <laughs> when he saw this. Because he was like a teenager. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. I don't like think I was probably movie. still a little young to get what was happening Me too. there. Me too. Yeah. 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 Uh, so there's an additional line here where Bruce brings up, quote, because after losing everyone I've ever loved, the only thing that broke Ivy's spell on me was the thought of losing you too. This so would have been explains. great. This yeah. would have been another like great scene. I don't know why they took all this out. I don't know. Uh, it's it too heavy for the kids. <laughs> No, but we can have Alfred talking about Batman trying to fight death itself. I know, right? <laughs> so he asks, will you trust me now? You know, this is the same scene in the movie. It's just with that added line about how, like, what broke the spell from Ivy was how much he cares about, <laughs> how much he cares about Dick. Anyway. <laughs> A <laughs> lot. Movie, Let me tell you. <laughs> he, he loves Dick. <laughs> A little too much. <laughs> in the movie, Barbara just hacks into Alfred's message to Wilfred. And <laughs> then we see her in the Batcave. Uh, in the script, however, it says Barbara goes to the grandfather clock from the comics. So, yes, we could have gotten the grandfather clock for the first time since the 1940s serials in live oh, action. Oh, shit. So this would have been cool. Barbara turns the clock to 1042, according to the script. Now, some fans are going to be like, it's not 1047, that's bullshit. Or 1048, as it is in the New 52. Well, the 1042 time actually comes from DC editor Dennis O'Neill. He wrote that in his Batman Bible. So that's actually where it comes from. It is rooted in what Dennis O'Neill uh, wrote in the script. I mean, wrote in the in the Bat Bible. Unfortunately, Dennis O'Neill would then watch this movie a year later and scream, apparently during the Bat credit card <laughs> scene oh, in yeah. agony. That's <laughs> right. To, that's yeah, right. According to one story I read, it was hilarious. Poor Dennis O'Neill. Um, <laughs> so Robin follows the Robin signal to Ivy, uh, and Ivy asks Robin to risk something for their love, too. She wants to know his true identity. So this is completely new. This is not in the movie. And so Robin decides, okay, because I love you, I'm going to do it. And he takes off his mask off and reveals that he's Dick Grayson. This shocked okay. me when I read it. I'm just like, wait, what? Where is this going? Because I just I just told the thought, it's the same movie. Just with He's under the pheromone right here, though, right? Yes, supposedly. Supposedly. So, because again, oh. this is where... Batman's oh, he's like, truly in love with her? He's truly yeah. crushing Batman's like, we can set a trap for, for Poison Ivy. So, like, in the movie, uh, well, we'll get into it in a bit. Uh, but basically, here, Poison Ivy now knows that Dick Grayson is Robin and has put together that Bruce Wayne is Batman. Mm-hmm. Um, it, we cut to Mr. Freeze at the observatory. He prepares to freeze Gotham, and he wants to know more about Bane. He's like, so tell me a little about, bit about yourself. Big family? Like pets? Any hobbies? <laughs> Don't talk much, do you? And then he just goes to singing... Walking in a winter wonderland. Oh, you just keep asking too many goddamn questions for me to fucking answer. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'm glad we didn't need that. Is uh, I prefer Arnold calling him Mr. Bane in the movie. Uh, <laughs> right. Back to the Ivy scene, though. Ivy fesses up. 
about Freeze's plan to freeze Gotham with a telescope and then kisses Dick Grayson and then reveals, by the way, you're going to die. Basically the scene in the movie, right? Uh, except right. now Dick has no mask. But Dick brings up that he won't die. And in the movie, this is where he just removes the rubber lips and says that they're immune to her charms. And I just was totally expecting that was going to be the case here. However, instead, no. Dick Grayson removes his face to reveal that he's Bruce Wayne. <laughs> Mission Impossible style. Like, I don't know. Maybe this is just because Kevin Coleman was excited for that movie. This is the second Mission Impossible type of thing I've seen here. So, Do they do face this. removal in the first one? In, yeah, yeah, they did. Because that's, that's, that's been a staple from the 1960s show. Oh, uh, shit. Mission I Impossible. forgot about that. Martin Lando's role in hand uh, was doing that. It was one of the big things. Oh, so. shit. Uh, so they went from removing... <laughs> lips to removing a whole goddamn face well it's the reverse of that because it's the first draft so yeah yeah imagine i mean yeah 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 it's chris o'donnell removing his face to reveal george clooney wearing a robin outfit <laughs> this is insane you know what you know what all right their it, body it, it, style's so different too but whatever i know, that dude. Too. I, know. I know <laughs> and bruce says i found something stronger than infatuation the cure to your evil spell and that's friendship Oh no! <laughs> That's a thankfully that was cut. <laughs> that, that'd be one of the first this, the things you the, cut. The what? That would be one of the first things you cut. Yeah, that's true. Actually, the more I go into this, the more I think we may, we might have lucked out on the movie we got. There's a lot of good here, though. There's a got a mix yeah. kind of the two, and then have them in a gray and blue suit, and you kind of have you kind of have gold actually. Yeah, yeah. Make it a little more Dozier esque. Make yeah. this like an actual '66 type of style thing, and I think you got something. Uh, yeah, definitely. So you could have made it real to... goofy too with like the pheromone yeah. shit. Mm-hmm. You could have had them like <laughs> doing all kinds of shit. Yeah, <laughs> that's any... true. But anyway, yeah. I kind of wish we had seen Wes go up against Poison Ivy in a way so we can get, you know, kind of see how he reacts to her charms, that type of stuff, and him resisting her. You know, yeah. Uh, that would have been awesome. But anyway, Ivy tries to fight Bruce, but Bruce is unwilling to strike back and hit a woman. And Ivy says, quote, you're about to die for your provincial outdated sexism. <laughs> and then Batgirl arrives and says, quote, maybe he won't hit a woman, but I will. Again, context, everybody, <laughs> on that line. Uh, so Batgirl defeats right. Ivy pretty easily. And then Bruce contacts Robin, who has been sitting in the back cave the whole time, uh, and tells him to tell Commissioner Gordon about Frieza's plan. I think we lucked out with what we got in the movie instead on that because again this is still george clooney wearing a robin outfit with no mask on at right. this point um so freeze sees the police arrive and freezes the street to subdue them humming quote return of the valkyrie which i think is i think he meant ride of the valkyries from wagner by Keith right. um freeze also gets pissed at bane for not laughing at his puns the thing is with, when they put <laughs> wagner in it just makes it like it's just the hitler connections too strong I know he's, but he's a German. Well, he's a villain. <laughs> he's a villain with a German accent. I mean, you know he's Austrian, but it's still similar. Well, also, yeah. It's an Austrian accent that's very similar to German. Arnold, Arnold's father was a Nazi, I think. So we might get corrected on that. Maybe he had, I don't know. Correct us in the fucking comments on yeah. that one. Uh, but maybe <laughs> they might have had something going on there. He said he was grew up around broken men. We all know that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That were from World War II or some shit mm-hmm. that were on the wrong side so let us know. so um let us know. yeah well, we let us know about that, that. Yeah, yeah yeah you know yeah. he was around that he saw that he was uh, he was definitely he around it yeah, that's right that a lot uh, yeah for good causes but uh batman robin and batgirl all meet at the frozen riverbanks they do not have separate ice armor toyetic you know bat suits in this version of the script they're kind of just wearing oh, what they usually wore which is an improvement too you know, trying to make the toyetic but still even when I was a kid, probably YouTube been <laughs> just terrible. Like we don't yeah. want that. That's they have. There is a Funko Clooney that I will just will not get. Somebody's gonna get it for me as a joke, probably. But <laughs> I will not get because it's that suit. It's the ice armor suit. I'm just like I don't want this one. This is this is. <laughs> it's not my least favorite one because that goes to the Gotham one. But <laughs> it's like a notch above that one. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean. We should do like the mo- the most toyetic Batman designs in a movie. Yet. Mm. Like yeah, it would, it, it, to me, it's it's just like the Bat p- Wing from '89 and the Batmobile, mm-hmm. and um, I mean, I'd say Scuba Batman's up there, you know. Like, there's just it's a design thing. Anyway, this is a whole other deal. Anyway, yeah. continue. Yeah. 
So we do unveil the ice armor vehicles, though. So we get a better introduction to them. We get the Bat Hammer, which is basically a modified white Batmobile on rocket skis, as it's described in the script. It's not as white in the final movie, as we can see here. Uh, there's a one-man ice boat called the Bat Skiff, which Robin's in charge of. And then uh, Batgirl's in charge of a snow cycle, which is, of course, the Bat Cycle. Um, so this is basically something that is in the movie, but now it's in a different context, where Batman and Robin have an exchange about Batgirl knowing who they are. And Robin jokes that they'll have to kill her. And Batman says, kill her later. We've got work to do. Which is in the movie, but it's just them standing around in Ivy's lair. In the script, though, Batman says, kill her later. We've got work to do. And then he gets in the bat hammer about to go assault Mr. Freeze's lair, which I thought was way cooler in the script. Right, yeah, yeah. So, I would have had a battering ram head kind of deal. Uh, it's not described in there, but goddamn, I would have loved it. Because it would totally <laughs> fit this. I, I've always wanted to see that. And yeah, it would have fit this world if you've got him in the yeah. black and I mean in the blue and gray and yellow suit, and then he's got the bat head battering ram on top of the the bat hammer over here, and he's storming the Mister Freeze thing. You got Batman, Robin, and Batgirl, and you've got like some variation combination of the Golden Fall theme and the Neil Hefty theme. It would have been fantastic. Him battering, battering, ramming the fucking like an ice dome or something. Yeah, a nice building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, yeah, that'd be cool for sure. Yeah. Also, As sounds toyetic. Blares. Yeah. Also, very yeah. toyetic. Like, I mean, if this had the battering ram head on it and stuff, this bat hammer thing, I definitely would have wanted that type of toy. Right. Something like that. Some something. But as it is, I'm just like, yeah, it just looks like a. You took the bat wing and you grounded it or something. There's something off about it. Uh, the Bat Family launches their assault, and Robin says, "Batgirl, be careful. No reckless stunts." And then he's like, "I can't believe I just said that." And Batman <laughs> smiles. Because this is Robin learning Bruce's point of view and looking out for someone. And I really like this, too, because, it, again, it's an arc for both characters in this. It's supposed right. to be Robin realizing what it's like for Bruce and Bruce sort of realizing so much of his control freak nature is due to being afraid of losing somebody he cares about. So, right, right, right. Uh, yeah. Mr. Freeze's men come out on snowmobiles. Robin causes two of them to crash and explode. So I'm just like, wait, Robin causes deaths in this? <laughs> There's a line where he's like, boy, I hope Freeze hires these guys by the dozen. I'm like, whoa, 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 Robin. You're killing these guys here. It, it, so. With this like cartoon logic going on, I'm not even sure if explosions mean death, but you know what I mean? It, it, like, It, it, it could have easily cut back and you just got them on the ground on the ice, just like rolling around and stuff. Yeah, and they got like a little yeah. charred costume with their faces yeah, intact. Like yeah, exactly. It's, it's Looney Tunes logic, really, you know? Yeah, it would have fit. It would have fit this world as well as the fact that it's like it's... It's a frozen Gotham at this point, so they're probably somewhat protected. I'd even put, like, Acme on a fucking bomb or some yeah. shit. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's all Warner Brothers. It's all the same company, so mm -hmm. why not? Yeah. <laughs> if it's this uh, kind of tone. Exactly. Uh, similar to a later draft, um, somebody... Well, okay, so Robin sings the 1960s song. Oh, man. Of okay. the Neil Hefty theme, but it says Batgirl instead of Batman, and Batgirl says that she's kind of catchy. I like it. Again, it's 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 very much trying to pay tribute to 66 while trying to kind of shit on 66 at the same time. So, and some instances here, not so much. But other instances, like the all, whole thing all about the, Commissioner Gordon. All these direct references were taken out of the final one, right? Yeah, yeah. There's no... Uh, like, at most, Goldenthal's score sometimes makes it sound like it's going, Batman, at certain parts. You know, kind of like... Oh, that's right. When Giacchino does it in The Batman. I think Goldenthal definitely does that with, like, the big brass. But, like, that's about it. Uh, I, I mean, like, I was a kid when this came out, but I feel like because I didn't grow up too much with the 66 show, Yeah, um, I watched, you know, that a little bit later after this movie. I don't think I really got it. I just thought, oh, this is a lot lighter than even Forever was. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder if a lot of people were, were like that, especially so younger, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but if they put in like real over the, you know, the hit you of the head with like, we're doing Adam West, everybody, at least one line, you know, if there's yeah. some sort of like, I mean, it's a little bit too direct, but then again, this whole movie's like that. So <laughs> it might have, it might have helped actually in some way, if, at least if there's one, one reference to one direct re reference to 66. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I, I think. Part of it's also that 89 was known for trying to get away from the shadow of Adam West. So I think fans sort of felt it was a betrayal to like go back to that. And I think it's, yeah, 
it's partially because this is a time where comic book movies haven't hit their stride yet, so they, there's an insecurity from fans about wanting these characters to be seen and taken seriously by people who aren't yeah, comic book fans. So that's when right. you've got something that seems so cheesy, people are just, it's another reason to point and laugh, as opposed to yeah. where we're at now in 2022, where like there's so many of them that if one fails, it's not like the end of the entire genre, people making fun of the entire genre. It's so mainstream now, it's so normal. To be like, yeah, I'm going to go see Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness next month and haven't read a single Doctor Strange comic. Like, it's completely normal now. <laughs> would have yeah. been strange, no pun intended, but it would have been, been weird in 1992 if that was happening. Or like, I mean, Deadpool kind of you know, came out in an environment of a shitload of movies mm-hmm. to make, kind of make fun of or, yeah. you know what I mean? To uh, Yeah, Deadpool wouldn't, have, wouldn't have exist it wouldn't have been quite as good in a vacuum. Yeah. People talk about that, mm-hmm. you know? So anyway, yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. I also That's also why I think for a lot of people, Zack Snyder's Watchmen came out too early. <laughs> Watchmen is all about deconstruction. It's all about mm-hmm. deconstructing superheroes. That's came right. Out a year after the MCU debuted and after The Dark Knight came out. It's just like it's too early, unfortunately, for that type of thing. I think if yeah. we release that now people would embrace that more would be like, Oh, look how like, that's kind of the response that, that some of the, you know, that like Joker in a way got, which like, look how different this is from like other comic book movies and stuff like that's, that probably would have been more welcomed in 2022 as opposed to 2009. But for oh sure, well. things for clearly sure. worked out for Snyder. <laughs> anyway, I mean, he's doing all right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the bad hammer's capabilities are seen more in the script. In the movie, he kind of just has a shield against Mr. Freeze's henchmen. But in the script, Mr. Freeze does try to freeze the bat hammer. But there's heating coils within it, which could be what the you know the lights inside are supposed to indicate. And it basically thaws the ice on the outside. So it's, it's unable to be frozen, which is cool. So after getting out of the vehicle, Batman then gets into a fight with Bane. This did not happen in the movie. Bane fought Robin and Batgirl uh, in the finale. But here... Batman fights Bane, and Bane kicks his ass. It says Batman as groggy, almost done for. Bane lifts him up over his knees and snaps him across it. Batman what? lays on the ground, broken. Yes, they did nightfall in this bitch. <laughs> Bane snaps Batman's back in the Batman and Robin script. Now, he doesn't end up breaking the back. I said snaps the back. Still, <laughs> still though, man, it's... <laughs> Uh, you know, it's it's fucking cartoon logic, so whatever. All right. Yeah, in, in this world, this, this did not... In this world, Clooney's Batman is somehow able to withstand that and not actually get his back broken. So he's just kind of incapacitated for a little bit, and he's on the ground, and he fires another battering at Bane, and Bane catches it again, but instead of crushing it, the battering ends up electrocuting him, and he just falls okay. over and is incapacitated. So I thought, okay, that's kind of a cool callback on here. Uh... Part of me is like, you kind of wasted the Nightfall thing on this, because I'm. if they really wanted to do Bane justice, they could have found something where, like, Bane ends up developing, like, more intelligence from something, you know, and then you can have another movie where it's just, like, you know, Benicio Del Toro dubs over the dude or something. <laughs> uh, Benicio Del Toro, actually, yeah. like, a real Bane for, like, the next movie, but whatever. Right. Uh, Robin and Batgirl end up fighting off the other henchmen. Robin... <laughs> Robin yodels in order to start an avalanche. <laughs> <laughs> Ricola. <laughs> remember those commercials? Oh, man. Brings me back. Remember? Remember? Yeah. Batgirl then starts punching thugs and says, pal, wham, kazow. And Robin's like, what exactly are you doing? And she's like, it just fits. So, again, Batman 66 reference. Um, Fucking and- yodeling, man. <laughs> It's just the old thing is go weirder goofy. than Batgirl's Batman sixty six reference. Let's be real on this. Yeah, yeah, it's just all right, whatever. Yeah. Sure. Uh, it then says Mister Freeze has a giant gun towards Brooklyn. I'm like, there's a Brooklyn in Gotham, but I guess so. <laughs> so that probably would have been rewritten. <laughs> Next is Brooklyn. Says <laughs> Arnold as he, as yeah. he points the cannon. That's yeah. Cool. Uh, Batman, whose back is completely fine at this point. Then shows up to confront Freeze and says, Millions will die so you can save on air conditioning. <laughs> Isn't that taking self help a little too far? <laughs> you really have a heart of ice. Thank God they cut that. I, I would hate hearing Clooney's flat delivery of heart of ice. Oh, that, yeah. That's clearly 
I mentioned that's clearly supposed to be an Easter egg to that animated series episode. Goldwyn's just being like, see, I saw I did my research on this. Right. Uh, Freeze says, quote, we aim to freeze as he tries to freeze Batman. Uh, <laughs> Robin enters the fight with Freeze, and Robin says to Bruce, this is a callback, he says, you left your back wide open. And Batman says, no, I knew you'd be there. So it signifies that the circle is complete. We now have trust and partnership, because in the beginning, Robin went through the simulator, and Batman's like, you left your back wide open. And Robin says, no, I knew you'd be there. And now it's the, uh, it's the callback at this point. Mm-hmm. So Batman asks Freeze, how do I follow the city? And Freeze says that he will never tell, even if he knew how. And Batman at this point is pissed off. He says, you've turned Gotham into ice. You've endangered countless lives. You almost killed my partner. It's payback time. And he headbutts Freeze's helmet so hard, it shatters the whole fishbowl helmet. And Freeze <laughs> goes right down on his knees. That would have been badass, except for maybe the it's payback time part. But everything mm-hmm. else leading up to it sounds pretty cool. So again, that's another part of the fishbowl helmet mm-hmm. playing a part in the in the thing. I imagine they were just like, eh, that's too easy at the end. But it would have been a cool visual, especially because Clooney's not really known for having a lot of badass moments as Batman. For is. sure, yeah, it would have been something, so, for yeah. sure. So Freeze is incapacitated at this point, and Batman's, base, Batman's like, you've got enough freezing gas. to You have basically enough in you left to keep you cold as long as you stay put. So, like, he kicked your ass, basically, on this, and Freeze can't go anywhere. He's incapacitated if he wants to survive. So that allows Batman, Batgirl, and Robin to thaw out Gotham City. And then Batman goes back to Freeze. And in this version, it is not some device that he pulls out of his utility belt to show that Ivy confessed to killing Nora Freeze. And it's not it's not a camera thing that just pops out of his lower ab like a comic adaptation. Uh, Batman ends up projecting his utility belt buckle, I guess, projects an image onto the floor, which shows Ivy's confession. And as I said, things are darker than in the movie. Batman does not end up saving Nora Freeze like he did in the movie. He did not even know that she was dead until Ivy confessed it. Uh, so Batman brings up that killing Ivy won't bring Nora back. And the only way to sort of move on from this is to help him sort of cure others, to bring Freeze back to being the doctor he used to be, which is a, you know basically the same moment in the movie. It's just that in this version, Nora is dead. So right. Freeze mourns his wife, but still agrees to give the cure over for McGregor Syndrome Stage 1, and still says, take two and call me in the morning, which honestly doesn't really fit in this version if he's, <laughs> if he's mourning over his wife at the same moment. But right. okay. um, Later, Ivy is getting arrested, and she yells out to the Gotham police that she knows Batman and Robin's true identities. Batman and Robin are Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson. And the police react to this. And Gordon says, then how do you explain that? And they turn to see Batman and Robin with Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson, along with Batgirl. And the cops end up just taking Ivy away to Arkham Asylum as Batman hits the hollow projector on his belt that was projecting a fake Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson. So their secret is safe. I guess that was his plan all along. (laughs) Okay. So Batman brings the cure back to Alfred, and apparently they all have pizza. (laughs) There's piles of pizza boxes and clothes around the living room. I guess this ties into the line in the movie where Alfred's like, I'll cancel the pizzas. Okay. Even though I don't really imagine Bruce and Dick eating a lot of pizzas. Ninja Turtles craze had just ended. (laughs) That's true. You know, so there's that. The uh, unintentional sequel to this is the Batman Ninja Turtles movie where Batman's arc is embracing pizza. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, (laughs) What a great arc it was. (laughs) (laughs) In this scene, Bruce finally calls Dick Nightwing, signifying his arc. Also okay. indicating that the next movie will probably be Batman, Nightwing, and Batgirl. Obviously, that didn't happen, though. Um, this is not the end, however. We now end in Arkham Asylum, where Mr. Freeze is in Arkham, and he works in the lab, where he gets a visitor. And that visitor is, this is a shock for Batman Forever fans, Dr. Burton. Yes, Dr. Oh, Burton from Batman shit. Forever. And deleted opening of Batman Forever as well. Rene Bourgeois' character would have returned, and he hopes that Freeze's rehabilitation will be successful. And as a treat, I guess he treats Freeze like a kid. As a treat, he gives Freeze an ice cream cone. <laughs> uh, okay. And Freeze's response is to pull Dr. Burton into the cold field and freeze him solid, and is implied to kill Dr. Burton in this moment. Weirdly, the first of two attempts to try to kill off Dr. Burton, the second being in the Batman Dark Knight script, where he would have been murdered by Scarecrow. 
but uh, Mr. Freeze then monologues to himself uh, in this moment. So I will have you deliver the final monologue. No matter that suns blaze or home fires burn, that warm smiles thaw icy hearts or passions heat the dead of night. For in the end, all passions cool, smiles turn to sorrow, and stars themselves surrender to the brutal chill of space. What flame doesn't dwindle when all is said and done? The universe dies, returns to cold. It is in its nature, as it is in mine. Rehabilitation is for sissies. (laughs) (laughs) You you were doing so well. (laughs) I know, right? Kind of dropped it in the fucking... uh, (laughs) Dropped the ball there in the last part. It's deliberate, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I, I know, but still, even if it's, I know it was deliberate, but man, that's just not good. It was, I just keep it, uh, keep it a, a heart of ice style. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, we then get I- which is funny, funny because I'm thinking yeah. as a fucking guy that s- not studies, but I look into fucking am- I'm am- I have some interest in astronomy and shit. When yeah. the universe ends, it's actually a heat death. They oh. call it the heat death of the universe. Well, it doesn't doesn't get colder. It actually gets hotter. He didn't study astronomy. I don't know what he does. Yeah, he doesn't know that shit. But uh, anyway, yeah. He's a doctor when it comes to cryogenic technology. Uh, yeah, I but, mean, the universe is generally extremely cold. Yes. Yeah. So, but yeah. Anyway, uh, we then get the scene of Freeze confronting Ivy in her cell, bringing up that winter has come at last, and implying that he's probably going to kill her for what she did to Nora, and. Then we get the image with the three heroes at the end. So to me, this is why I say it's a darker ending. To me, it means Mr. Freeze has lost his wife. He is worse than ever when it comes to his mental health state. He is not rehabilitated at all. He kills Ivy and is basically going to go off and kill more people. (laughs) Ta-da, kids. (laughs) Here you go, kids. Batman and Robin. (laughs) There's no way. I mean, obviously it didn't. It was rewritten, but... yeah. Yeah, there, yeah. there's just no way this would have made it to the screen. It's a weird ending to it. Yeah. Like, okay, so he kills the dude and then goes and it's implied he kills Ivy. Like, uh, what's going on here? So It's like the uh, writer's attempt to make it, to bring it bring it back to being darker. I mean, why write it? You know, they probably, mashed up, probably yeah. knew the, yeah, the general direction they wanted, but he still wrote in this way. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, that is the 1996 first draft of Batman and Robin. Again, this is an exclusive of ours. We got this thanks to Derek O. This is not something we can pass along, guys, so for the time being, this is just going to be how you end up absorbing the script. But uh, for this, was there anything that really stood out? I imagine the Mr. Freeze dialogue stuff was interesting, aside from him dropping the ball at the end of every single monologue <laughs> yeah some joke. Uh, not as bad as that last one but <laughs> um yeah the dialogue is better and uh, you know there's some things that were worse but some things that were that were better so yeah to me it's it's just always like um okay here's a here's a good example especially from like i feel like this is a very me thing to say but or whatever, but like if like after living in Japan and living in America, you you start to see you start to like I wish this this part of Japan was in America. When I was in Japan, I wish there were American parts in Japan. And right, you start yeah. to have this like perfect country in your head, but it doesn't fucking exist because you know you can't just have all the good parts, none of the bad parts thrown into one one you know make it uh, one country, right? So uh, that's kind of like where he- I, 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 with the head cannon thing, that's kind of what this is too, right? Like people want to create yep. their perfect Batman movie, and uh, but yeah, if you had elements of of this script mixed with like the 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 gray and blue suit and some of the other parts we mm-hmm. had, like we would have had like our perfect our perfect Batman and Robin movie, our perfect cheesy Adam West homage yeah. movie. Um, definitely. 
Yeah, most surprising thing is just was probably the Mr. Freeze stuff. I, you know, I, it's all I kind of wish that there, it was just Mr. Freeze or just yeah. Poison, uh, Poison Ivy. Like mm-hmm. it, Mr. Freeze's arc is so interesting on its own. The Nora story, you don't really need Poison Ivy, honestly. I mean, I know that that takes women out of the movie, but <laughs> but but or or take him out and put make it just Poison Ivy and just about mm-hmm. Bruce. I don't know, you know, like it's just like this is when they started started really calling superhero movies overcrowded. I think if I remember my yeah. little kid brain, like I don't even think they were saying that with with Batman Forever too much. But when this movie came this out, yeah. people were having that conversation. Mm-hmm. So, um, I mean, what was your what were you what do you think? When I was going through it, I I mean, I completely agree. Where it's it's one with like there are certain elements from just like oh man, this would have been really cool. You know, whether it's yeah. the, you know, Mr. Freeze doing the Mission Impossible thing uh, at the Gotham Diamond Mart. That would have been cool. Uh, a lot right. of the additional, any of the stuff that has to do with Bruce and Dick's traumas, explaining their behaviors and them basically being challenged in order to, to grow as a team. Like all yeah. that stuff should have been in there. Uh, also, there's just less puns and corny one liners. They're still in there. They're still in there. But like some of the most notorious scenes or most notorious lines in here. Are just not in here, so that's an improvement. What's not an improvement is, you know, stuff like the rubber lips is definitely an improvement over the Mission Impossible thing of George Clooney <laughs> wearing a Crystal Donald mask the whole time. Dude, that's so that silly though. Yeah, that's I know. so silly. I <laughs> kind of like it though. <laughs> kind of like that. It's yeah. just you just would you just wouldn't expect that. <laughs> That's a hell of a move, man. Yeah. No. You know? Uh, there's that. I think Bruce is smarter in the final film than in elements of this in terms of that he figures out on his own that Alfred's dying. He figures out on his own that Pamela Isley is Poison Ivy. And then, of course, I prefer Nora living at the end and Freeze rehabilitating because if, if Freeze doesn't rehabilitate at the end, then Batman's whole speech to him about, like, you know, the man that she loved is still buried there deep beneath the snow. Like, that entire speech is ineffective. It just means that Batman failed. Yeah. Yeah, like what, like what makes that such a great moment is like, it's. I gotta think about this. I think this is probably the only time where Batman has successfully tried to redeem a villain at the end of the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you talked about this when we did the yeah our deep dive into the movie. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That didn't really happen with any of the other any of the other versions. It's always like, okay, I guess I gotta fight you, uh, mm-hmm. and all that type of stuff. It never really ends with him trying to rehabilitate that person cure that ass yeah like for uh, spider-man <laughs> so it, it, yeah, it never really ends up that way but here it does and it seems successful so for it not to be successful and to have this darker ending is just it just it's weird in something that's already like cheesy for kids and and you know about superheroes and, and shit and now it's like okay but then you've given it the darker ending of like a, a darker movie yeah, it's like the they're trying to be Empire, where it's like the darkest yeah. of the tr- of the trilogy. But mm-hmm. we're four movies deep for one, and they're going super kitty. And yeah, I mean, I don't think this is just an American thing. I mean, people talk about how the French are kind of like sad endings, but I'm sure even in French kids' films, they're probably end on a happier note. Yeah, you know. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it's just odd. Yeah, it is. But uh, that is the unmade 1996 Batman and Robin draft, and that is superhero stuff you should know. Big thanks to our research assistant, Dan, for the visuals on this and providing all that. And uh, we also have a few more Schumacher cut pictures we didn't show. So images I promised. I said I fucked up last time not showing this. This is Riddler reading the newspaper, uh, along with another image of Two-Face confronting him about the fact that Batman is... uh, you know, still alive and stuff, and it looks a lot more serious than what we've got in the movie. It does, so, yeah. There's that. Uh, Nigma looks really pissed here, too, on the left. <laughs> He's like, why are you taking up my screen? <laughs> I am the star of this film. Indeed. Uh, and then an alternate shot of Bruce. Oh. Yes. It looks almost cute in this photo. Duh. Cuter than the other shots. want to boop his nose. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, moving on then, this is tied into what we talked about, but uh, we got a comment from Paradox Camera saying, in the theatrical version, we do see Dick in the party scene when Bruce and Chase enter. 
So, uh, yes and no. So here's the thing. In the movie, which we have pictured on the right, we see Dick, Chase, and Bruce at the bottom of the stairs after he's walked them in. Uh, the specific moment that was brought up in the episode is what probably happens before that, where it looks like they're at the top of the stairs before they go down. And even the trading card here brings up that Dick almost calls Bruce Batman, and Bruce murmurs, please don't make me kill you. <laughs> so, which is in the script. So it seems likely that they did shoot this because of the fact that we've got this image of them at the top of the stairs. Or maybe they just cut it and they're just like, all right, like we want you to just start from the top of the stairs and then just make your way down and we'll just capture you there. Like, who knows on that? We don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, thank you for that addition because I, I had forgotten about this specific like two second shot where Dick is there. Uh, moving further, I thought this would be very interesting to bring up in a Batman and Robin episode. I don't know if you saw this one yet. So this is from Stan Wood 32. Another awesome podcast about the Schumacher cut. Love you guys. Wanted to share for fun, but I actually tried out for Robin in 1994. Damn. For Batman Forever. I was at a karate tournament and was given information about the casting. I had the chance to meet Molly Flynn, uh, Molly Finn, and had a callback, but, well, you know the rest. I was 15 at the time. She told me I was too young <laughs> for the part. And if only I was a few years older. A few years. You were 10 years too young, apparently, because this was yeah. this. who was 25 at the time. Uh, he says, I still have the callback sheet. I also later found out that there was a nationwide casting call and there were hundreds auditioning. Again, thanks for all that you guys put into these entertaining podcasts. It makes my day. Stan. Man, that's awesome, dude. That is. Uh, also, yeah, this is the first I've heard of, of somebody who who auditioned for this who, you know, obviously wasn't somebody who was like Leonardo DiCaprio, like wasn't like a big name actor, but was somebody who was just like wanted to audition because could be a cool discovery of a kid actor, you know? What um, moves did you do, man? I want to know now. Let us know, yeah. <laughs> fucking karate um, moves, dude. What that audition was like, because I'm sure you remember it. Uh, yeah. yeah that's, that's pretty awesome on that. I do wish, you know, I think Batman Forever would be better with somebody who actually was 18. <laughs> no offense to Chris O'Donnell, but yeah. <laughs> it would have been, yeah, he should be a it fucking just teenager. It would have worked. And also, it, it just makes the fact that he acts this way is more excusable <laughs> when it comes from an 18-year-old. Yeah, Not exactly. when it comes from a 45 year old. I mean, I'd go even younger, maybe, man, because it's just like you have the vulnerability of a kid. I mean, think, That's I mean, true. it's look at the how they cast, you know, Spider Man. He's actually like 16, 15 when he got the fucking role, you know, uh, you know Tom Holland, you know, like you just do something like that with Robin. Yeah, and I think they had to work their way up to it because I'm sure at the time they're just like, yeah, nobody's going to believe that. And now we've gotten like Chloe Moretz as Hit Girl, we've gotten Tom Holland as Spider Man, like. We've gotten all sorts of shit, so it, it just was the wrong time for that type of stuff. But especially if it's a kids' movie, your kids, it's it's a kid representation. You want to see that yourself represented point. on screen. Yeah. That's yeah. the whole point of these these uh, sidekicks, and so to, to yeah. not give them that is is really kind of doing the story the service as well as the audience. Yeah, That's exactly, exactly, man. So, yeah. you know. Uh, and the last one comes from Aaron Quinn. On, uh, this is about the Batman, so I wanted to bring this up. Uh, I had previously stated erroneously that the fins on the forearm gauntlet on Pattinson are no longer there. It's just been replaced by the the basically the bow shirt kids that are there. But Aaron brought up the fins are on the suit; they're just straps now instead of the gauntlets, and we can see that here. Uh, this oh, is sure. from the upcoming concept art book, "The Art of the Batman." You know for sure we're going to get you know we're going to take a look at that for our, our concept art episode. But uh, this is a look into it, and sure enough, yes, they are there. I just didn't, I just did not see them during the movie. So they're there, though. I love it when no they're used. Like he uses it to block a sword, right, and to break it off, and uh, it begins. It begins, right? Like, yeah, yeah, and he's deflecting the swords in '89, which is probably where that idea first comes from. Yeah, I could watch that all day. That yeah. them use it, like I like seeing the gauntlets being used tactically, and the ca mm -hmm. the cape should be used more tactically too. Like we always bring up a, yeah. a cape, a weapon. Yeah. You know, you could, the, choke, uh, you could choke out a dude and not kill him. Yeah. He does it all the time, right? Just does, choke yeah. choke out a dude with the cape, man. If he has the time, like, it's one of those, like, he has to sneak in, that type of thing. And just, yes. Like, he, There's he a scene in out, just like, going. Michael Mann's um, Miami Vice, I think it was Miami Vice, the movie that came out, like, I don't know, mm. 10 years ago. There's a pretty cool like choke out scene in that movie, and like I'd love for them to kind of do that with the cape, man. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, that'd be cool. Yeah, 
Uh, but yeah, that is it. New this April from HyperX. It's the HyperX Clutch Controller. Get better control of your mobile gaming with its comfortable grip, directional pad, analog sticks, and shoulder buttons. This versatile controller can fit a variety of phone widths and can also connect wirelessly for use on tablets and PCs. Learn more and pick one up online at HyperX and HP.com, Amazon, Micro Center, Target, Best Buy, and many other fine retailers. Over to the fan shoutouts. Oh man, we're already there, guys. Jeez. I think we are over two hours. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. I guess I was having fun. (laughs) All right. So we want to thank, uh, let's thank Logan Wood, who is Shane Helms121 on Instagram, Griffin W, Daniel V, Pete B, Halsey C, Maurice D, Jonathan, Noel. And Robert H. And, of course, the rest on the list in the um, YouTube version, if you're an aural listener, if you love <laughs> getting aural from us. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, yeah, and we have other supporters as well. Please check out that list. Um, do we have any new other supporters? No, right? It looks like. Not at the moment. Uh, not the last moment. one listed is Derek O., who did provide us the script for this episode. So oh, again, shit. Derek. Well, we have to fucking say you aurally. Yes. Uh, the rest are visuals, so there, there we go. Moving on. Um, thank you again, everybody, on those and the list. Um, and uh, we also have the uh, so <laughs> yeah, patreoncom superhero stuff pod. That's our Patreon, y'all. Um, so we have a one dollar tier that gets you the shout out, be it visual or aural. And then we have our five dollar tier, which is a whole new show. It's a whole other show so it's every uh not, yeah it's every friday this show you're watching right now or listening to orally is um every monday and then we have this show is every friday so check that out five dollar tier gets you uh that and you can binge it the whole time and you also get the shout out as well um it'll be oral i'm gonna keep saying oral <laughs> it'll be <laughs> it'll be oral uh for the first time or two uh, as well, so there's that, and then the ten dollar tier uh, that gets you the tiers below it, but also uh, the, it's the monthly meetup tier, so you get to join us and kind of hang out and also chat about a topic at hand, kind of mm-hmm. a little bit of both, uh, and um, that is once a month. It is the monthly meetup, so yeah, there's that. That's ten dollars, and uh, then um, our merch. So we have um, superhousepod.redbubble.com and superheroesstuffpod.threadless.com. Zacula, Ben Man, Indeed Wizard, mug, shirt, shower curtains, and all the rest. Artwork by Stefan Santa Cruz. Then please send us some audio. Been an absolute paucity of audio recently. An absolute dearth, if you will, of... <laughs> <laughs> I love synonyms. <laughs> anyway, uh, of audio, please send audio clips. It doesn't have to be a funny voice. It could just be love the show or whatever. Uh, so s- send that to superhousepodcast at gmail.com. I'm Thunderwolf Drew on Instagram and Twitter. Thunderwolf lives on YouTube. Thunderwolfdrew.com has my whole portfolio except for uh, amanorecon.com. That's A-M-A-N-O-R-E-C-O-N.com. Original idea that I'm doing uh, I got some things we're filming this month, actually. Uh, more on that later. Anyway, it's R-rated Power Rangers and uh, meets X-Files. Original idea, though, it's not a Power Rangers fan film. A lot of those are around, and they're great. But this is not a fan film. It is its own thing. And it's going... We're filming the campaign video that's going to be on the top of the Indiegogo page. Uh, Indiegogo is like Kickstarter, but more geared towards indie film. So check out that. And then the uh, poster art is by Zach, uh, Zachary Jackson Brown. So check that out. And I'm done. Ben. Shout out to Comic Capital on Instagram as well as the Everything Entertainment Club on Clubhouse. You can follow us on social media at Twitter at Superhouse Pod, Instagram at Superhero Stuff Pod, TikTok, Superhero Stuff Pod, Vero, Superhero Stuff Pod. My website is benwanrider.com, where you can read my Gotham script, Gotham Vampire, where young Bruce faces off against the Mad Monk, as well as my spec script for Elementary called The Death of Sherlock Holmes, a modern update on the classic story, The Adventure of the Dying Detective. And Curb Your Enthusiasm, Disneyland, the Curb Your Enthusiasm episode they could never make, where Larry goes to Disneyland. My 
YouTube channel is in the description below, where you can also check out a new, by basically the Doctor Who, the Ronin of Time, audio drama that I write, narrate, and edit. And my personal Instagram is Ben Juan Ryder. My cat's Instagram, my son that you saw earlier in this episode, is Alfie at Alfie Pennyworth Cat. And if you have an Alfie or a Peanut or any cat, then you can get the Whisker Box, the only cat box for the crazy cat lady and gent. And if you don't have a cat but you have a dog instead, that's okay too, because you can get the Bark Box, y'all. Yes. Give your dog exactly what they want with the Bark Box. Use our promo link available at SuperheroStuffPod.com slash shop. Get the first month off free, valued at $35. Again, SuperheroStuffPod.com slash shop, where you can get all sorts of other shit. eBay, Amazon affiliate links, links to the concept art book that we keep talking about, The Batman, The Definitive History of the Dark Knight by Andrew Farrago and Gina McIntyre. And let's not forget Manscaped. Yes, still pushing this. Manscaped, get 20% off and free shipping by using the promo code Johnson's Ballsack at manscaped.com. Your balls will thank you. <laughs> the greatest Over to Andrew. greatest ball trimmer of all time. <laughs> yes. And we want you to do us a favor. We want you to do all... Well, hold on a second. <laughs> Take two. You... Take two. We want you to tell all your friends about us. I was about to say, we want you to do all your friends for us. That's different. <laughs> if you're under the pheromones. We want you to fuck everyone. <laughs> Good, fuck night. Good night. Good night.